you're like me, the chaos of everyday life can sometimes feel utterly overwhelming, like you're stuck in place and everyone is just passing you by. This is how I felt a few months ago, until I discovered the Yours app. A remarkable app that is my go-to for all things meditation and relaxation, to help really push away the stress and anxiety of existence, especially the yoga and meditation courses which I find help calm me down very quickly. Now, if any of you are interested, you can download the app for free to give it a go. And if you like, I've actually partnered with the Yours app and have snagged you a great deal. You get 60% off an annual plan with the discount code MORTIS, as you can see. And I'm sure it will help you find your inner peace too. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. As a kid, I moved around a lot. I lived in a total of eight different countries. The fifth country I lived in was Germany, in the city of Kiel, in Schwelzwig, Holstein, North Germany near Denmark. I lived there for nine months between the ages of 11 and 12, and I'm 20 now. I have four siblings, an older sister and brother, and a younger sister and brother. Now onto the actual supposed paranormal side of this. My mother and father worked from the hours of 10 to 6. During this time we'd be at school, and then home alone for about 3 hours. My younger sister, age 7 at the time, and my younger brother, age 9, were picked up by a family friend and taken to her house during this time. My older brother, age 16 at the time, went to his girlfriend's or played football. Me and my sister, age 12, were home. We had lived in Germany for exactly 2 weeks. We arrived at our house, and unfortunately we found our cat, who was 18, had passed away. We weren't religious, but our cleaner was, and she found us crying over our cat, and she prayed. Before leaving that night around 5, she said, I'm so sorry, or something akin to it, but we told her it was fine and that we would get a new cat. And then she said, no girls, I'm sorry for what's to happen in the future. She said that exactly. Our German was bad, her English wasn't the best, and we didn't understand. But being the children we were, we brushed it off and went inside to play Wii Sports instead. A week later we got home, and my older brother came with us for once. We'd all been sitting around for a few minutes when my brother said, Sandy, I bet we can play hide and seek and you will lose. And then my sister said she wanted to join in. I wish I'd never played. We decided that the top floor of the house was off limits, and we'd play on the bottom floor. So we did. It went well until I couldn't find my sister for an hour and a half. My parents got home and we said we'd lost her. They went into the garden to search and my father got angry. He went to the bar, and we searched absolutely everywhere. Until my mum went into the attic. And there she was. My mum went over to ask her why she didn't stay on the bottom floor, but my sister didn't reply. She didn't actually come out. She stayed up there for four days before getting so dehydrated she came down and fell down the stairs. We took her to a hospital. She had broken collarbones and stayed in the hospital for a while. When we got back, she was never the same. She wouldn't speak. She'd only eat basic foods and very small amounts of it. My parents were angry. They had no sympathy and probably weren't really the best parents. This carried on for the rest of our time in Germany until my sister said one day out the blue, after not speaking for about three weeks, I saw something. This drove my mum insane, and we soon moved. This carried on for a while until I was 15 and she 16. She no longer went to school. She had a wheelchair because she refused to walk. At this point, we still lived in the same country after Germany, which was the small country of Monaco. We lived in Monte Carlo, and it was a paradise for me. I was very, very happy, but my sister didn't like it. She became angry at me, and at me only. She started to harass me. My mum soon took sides, and she'd become distant from my older sister, and I was too, to be honest. My father took my sister aside, saying it wasn't her fault. Two weeks before my 16th birthday, she started to talk. 
It was just rambling, but it was stuff like, I saw them, I saw things. The day before my 16th birthday, we were all having a meal and she started smiling. My dad looked up and said, look Poppy, she's happy, see she's happy. This resulted in an argument and after this ridiculous argument was over, my sister just said in a completely normal voice, I want Sandy to see them too. This freaked out my mother. The next day I had my birthday and the same day my mother told me we were going on a road trip. Just me and my other sister who was 12. We took a road trip all the way over to Belarus on the other side of Europe. My parents soon divorced and my mum brought a lovely house in Belarus for just me, her and my younger sister using the divorce money. I have never seen my father, either of my brothers or sister again. I know that they now live in Wyoming, which is my father's birthplace. And my sister recently came out of a mental facility. Apparently she's fine now. My mother and my younger sister, currently 16, now live in Liechtenstein, which is my mother's birthplace. And I live with my roommate in Croatia. Everything was normal until my sister texted me on my 20th birthday. Her text read exactly, happy birthday. Now that you've reached 20, I'm able to tell you what I saw. There was a woman. At first I thought she was a man, but she was a woman. She told me I was her baby. She was dark, gray, almost like a shadow. I didn't want to tell you because I worry that you'll see her too, but she's never stopped following me. Sometimes she goes away. Sometimes she stays with me for a very long time. The medication doesn't make her go away. The medication makes her kind to me. I love you, Susan. I have no idea what to think anymore. To be honest, I still have to respond to her text. I don't know what to say. I'm very tempted to just say, sorry, wrong number. This happened a while ago, when I was 17. I had been living with my eldest sister as a sort of living babysitter for my three nephews at the time. And my room was in the unfinished basement. Sort of just a big area rug on the floor, a dresser bed, TV, the usual. I was down there reading or something one day when I heard my sister's voice clear as day call down to me. Hey, come upstairs. Having no reason to think anything of it, I rolled off my bed and made my way towards the stairs. I get about halfway up when a feeling of absolute terror hits me. My hairs stand on end, my skin crawls. It's the middle of the day. The sun is shining brightly through the many windows of the entryway that sits atop of the open stairs. I try and shake it off, wondering what the heck. I get to the top and the feeling only gets worse. I call out my sister's name, realizing something quickly. The house is silent. Anybody with any number of young kids, especially three boys all under 10, knows that doesn't happen. There's a little carpeted set of stairs that leads to the always open French doors of the main house. I don't see anyone inside, and as soon as I take a step towards them, my heart leaps to my throat. I've never been afraid of anything in that moment and on a whim I walked away to check the attachment of the garage for a car. I just opened the door when I heard her voice say again, Come in here. I glanced into the garage and saw her car wasn't there. I didn't waste any time. I raced down the basement steps to grab my car keys and loped out of there. It's been ten years and I still don't know what happened. I told my friends and family and got a few, You scared yourself, you silly girl and you must have imagined it. But I don't think so. I've been living out there for months by that time and been alone plenty of times and nothing like that had ever happened before. If anyone has any ideas what it could have been, I'm all ears. This happened to me in 2016, but I was having trouble sleeping tonight and my brain dredged this up from my memories. I had recently moved back to my college town so I could rent an apartment with a friend after a long-term relationship ended. I was doing a lot of job hunting for pretty much anything, as I was pretty desperate for income and unsuccessful with finding work within my career field. 
I was using multiple job sites, but mostly Indeed because I liked their website feature that helps you track which jobs you've applied for and their status. There were of course some jobs that I applied for on their own website, but I kept track. After a few weeks of searching, I get a call. I don't recognize the number and the area code wasn't familiar, but I pick it up as it might be a job prospect. A woman is on the other end and she says that she's calling to set up an interview as I had applied for their company. The company's name was not something that I remembered applying for. While on the phone with her, I quickly pulled up Indeed on my laptop and looked through all the jobs I had applied for. None matched. I have no idea what this job is, but don't make this apparent on the phone as I've been job searching for weeks and I'm still unemployed. I ask her for the address of the building and write it down. Looking back, I can't remember the name she gave me, but what I do remember was how pushy she was into scheduling the interview for later that evening. I agree to do the interview and thank her, but as I hang up, I get a very bad feeling. Something doesn't seem right. So I Google the phone number and it's not linked to a company. I Google the address and it's also not affiliated with a company. It's from way outside the distance of jobs that I was applying for, almost an hour away from where I live. And I pull up a Google street view and I can see that the address she gave me is several small rundown buildings with a highway exit in the distance. It looked desolate. I pictured driving myself there around dusk when she scheduled the interview for, and I could physically feel this sensation of dread settling within me. I didn't want to go. I brought all of this up to my roomie and he said that I might be overthinking it, but if I wasn't comfortable with it to just not go. I'm so glad I didn't. The more time passes, the more I am aware of just how shady it was. In hindsight, I wish that I had gone to the police, but I didn't at the time because the year prior, I hadn't had much faith in them. As I tried to get a restraining order before an ex tried harming me, but it never worked out. Who knows what would have happened if I'd have gone. It's certainly a scary thought. I live with three other guys in a duplex. What happened was around Christmas time and our living community consists of a mix of college kids and families. One evening, my girlfriend and I arrived at the vacant house around 8 PM. All the lights were off, which was normal. And upon entering, we smelled the welcoming scent of freshly baked cookies. Turning on the kitchen light, we felt the heat of the oven radiate through the chilly home. And oddly enough, there were no cookies. There were a couple of Tupperware containers pulled out from the cabinet, but no cookies in them. Slightly stranger, eight by eight brownie containers were found in the sink. And there was a spatula covered in cookie dough, chocolate chip to be precise. Who bakes cookies in those square containers? One by one, my roommate came back to the house. Will, Jack, Brian. Jack claims to not have baked any cookies, as well as Will. Brian is known to bake all the time, so we waited for him to return. Lo and behold, he comes back and swears he hadn't baked anything. We all looked at each other in confusion and dismay. Who would come into a college kid's house and do such a thing? And might I add, no belongings were stolen. Our 51 inch TV was still there along with all the gaming consoles and music equipment, clothes and laptop. Upon further investigation, we conclude the house was completely empty for a total of roughly four hours. And there was in fact cookie residue on both the spatula and the Tupperware. The trash cans inside and outside the house had no evidence of any cookie business going down. Whatever happened to me and my roommates is truly incredibly unexplainable. My grandfather used to work as a janitor slash keeper in my old primary school. So I used to hang out with him all the time. He had his shifts usually in the morning and afternoon, but from time to time he'd work a night shift. So what you have to know about my school is the fact that it has a basement where my granddad has his room. 
three floors with classrooms and the attic. It had two staircases, the wooden one that connected floors one to three, and the stone one that connected the basement, the first to third floors and the attic. Now onto the story. One Saturday, me and my grandparents decided to visit my granddad on his night shift, so we arrived around 8 p.m. and stayed till almost 11. I was playing around the school, which was a bit creepy at night, but I had a flashlight and some lights in school were still on. I was on the third floor and kept hearing noises that sounded like footsteps from the attic. I found it weird because I was standing right next to the stone staircase and did not see anyone go up, but I was playing so I thought I must have missed my grandpa going upstairs. I came up to check every door to try and find him so that I could help him, but all of them were locked. I came down with no idea of what was going on and that's when I heard the footsteps again. That's when I realized what I was just witnessing. I nearly broke my legs running down the stairs to tell my parents. They were all sitting there, even my granddad. I asked him if they had just been upstairs and they said they hadn't been. From this day, I still don't know what I heard but I sure as hell started to believe in ghosts since that experience. Back in the fall of 2019, I would frequently study at my university's library. It had a new addition built in the 90s and most people would occupy that part. I would use the older side of the library because it was usually empty and very quiet. I would go take the steps down to the library's basement and there was a long hallway consisted of private classrooms and storage. But towards the way back, there were a very small number of rooms for studying that had some desks and three tall bookshelves. It was around 9 p.m., and I was the last one studying inside the room. One of the night guards was sitting by the door occupied by his crossword puzzle book. He was an older man, but he was very nice, and sometimes would let me stay a little past closing time to let me study. I was halfway through my environmental science homework, when things started to get a little odd. The sound of a door opening and then closing echoed loudly throughout the hallway, just across from where I was sitting. The guard looked a bit surprised at first. No one was allowed downstairs at those hours. I heard him radio one of his fellow guards and asked if anyone else was down in the basement making rounds. He was met with a negative. He got up and left the room without saying a word. I went back to studying and ten minutes later or so had passed since the guard left. It's very late, a woman's voice yelled from what sounded like right behind me. I turned around thinking it was a professor, but no one was there or in the hallway. I frantically packed up my things and headed towards the door. I didn't even bother to look back. I just looked out of there. I bolted up the stairs and was met with the guard from earlier. He asked if I was alright and I nodded that I was and that it was just getting late. What, did old Maggie scare you? He chuckled. I was confused. He looked at me for a moment and nodded. He told me that Maggie was a librarian that used to work for the school back in 1950, but was struck in a hit and run outside the university one winter's night. She had worked for the school for 12 years and was apparently a very old sweet woman, and he didn't learn about her until he himself had a few strange occurrences on some of his night shifts. Since that night, I tried only studying in the new edition if the downstairs study rooms were empty. I work in the criminal justice field, where I see a lot of crime, and I'm also naturally a follower of scary movies and stories in general. So I have to disclaim that I do have a heightened sense of paranoia, but my girlfriend and her roommate both agreed this was weird. I was out walking my girlfriend's roommate's dog as she was working a night shift in their neighborhood which is a very safe suburb of New York. I walked across the parking lot and to this field in the middle of a rotary or roundabout, whatever you call them. I lived in Boston for a while and they call them rotaries and was screwing around on Reddit since it was near midnight 
and in the middle of quarantine, so there were no cars out. The dog had a long leash, so she was sniffing around, and then I saw her stop and stare toward the road. I looked up, and saw a black SUV stopped in the rotary. I pulled on my COVID mask that was on my chin, since no one was around. I had it off, and some people in New York are touchy about that, which is understandable. Just in case they stopped to lecture me, and I didn't care to engage in argument. I looked back at my phone, and then back up, and the SUV was still there. It was a family. Mother, father in the front, and a twelve-year-old daughter, or something like that, in the back seat. I was a bit startled because they were all just blankly staring directly at me. I sort of waved and nodded, and started walking the dog a bit around the grass, and they started to move slowly. They came around the rotary, and I looked back, and all of them were staring at me again. I figured they may talk to me, so I stopped and waited for them to get around the circle. But when they approached, they kept driving very slowly, all staring directly at me. I gave another half wave, and they drove past me, still slowly and staring, and then back around the circle, and then again around the circle. Literally, all of them blank at staring me, even with a little girl in the back seat. They did this a few more times. And I started to walk up to the edge of the circle to engage, which is normally something I would not do. But it was a family, so I felt a little bit more brave. They sped up a bit and went around the corner and turned off the rotary. I started to feel even weirder, so I decided I would walk back to her apartment building when they entered the rotary again. I was watching them from the corner of my eye, and they were still staring. I started picking up the pace. And they turned off the rotary towards me, and I picked up the pace as they followed me. Once I got to the sidewalk, I turned around because I didn't want them to know which door I was walking into. It's on a strip mall with a few other apartment buildings and stores, and they stopped about thirty feet behind me, and they were all staring out the front window. The little girl was in the center seat now, staring too. I once again raised my arm. Can I help you? And got no response at all. I kind of stood there and no movement, and took my phone out and typed their license plate into a notepad. I was thinking this is starting to get weird. I then slowly turned on the other side of the parking lot, all still staring, until they got to the end and I rushed into the apartment building, which luckily needs a code to enter. I got up, told my girlfriend and her roomie about it in the morning. And they both freaked out a little. I watched them out the window, and they pulled back up to where I was standing on the sidewalk and just sat there in their car. I couldn't see them at this point; could only see the roof. It felt like ten minutes before they slowly started to drive away. I can't stop thinking about their creepy ass blank stare. Somehow it made it creepier that it was a normal looking family with a young daughter. If it was like two younger guys, I could have marked it off as they were bored and just messing with me. But this made no sense. Once, when I was really young, like one of my earliest memories, me and my two older brothers and my oldest sister were home alone while my parents were out. This is Baltimore City, and late at night, and suddenly there's a knock on the door. We ignore it like we're supposed to. Then it's a banging, and a man's voice yells, "I know you're in there. Let me in." We freak out. My sister grabs a knife and yells for him to go away. "I'm your uncle John. Let me in." We don't have an uncle John. I'm your dad's brother. My dad doesn't have a brother. He he doesn't know about him. Let me in. By this time, we've called the cops and are huddled under a table. Sister, with knife in hand. Cops show up and arrest him on sight. Parents come home freaking out, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we learnt about my dad's long-lost brother who lives in Virginia. The only way I can think this dude didn't know that this was creepy as hell was that he was from the country and maybe didn't think showing up unannounced to meet lost Kim was weird. But to、uh, some kids from Baltimore, 
We're terrified. In July, my family and I moved to a new house. Since then, there have been several occurrences that make me believe we were not alone. When we first moved in, the realtor told us to never open the attic. He claimed it was because the attic was filled with insulation. I thought this was weird that he told us to never go up there. Then my curiosity got the best of me. I had a look inside before I went to bed the first night and I climbed up and looked at the attic. When I opened the door, there was nothing there. When I saw it wasn't filled with insulation, I decided to go all the way up to see if the attic could be used as storage. As soon as I walked in, I realized it was freezing cold. It was 90 degrees that day and the AC was not on. Then I felt extremely lightheaded and could barely walk down the stairs to get out of the attic. Secondly, I have a 13 year old poodle and she's normally a very chill dog. She doesn't bark often, but since the move, she will randomly start barking at nothing or she'll start whining and crying for no reason. Third, where my bedroom is to the attic. The attic is right above my room and often I'm woken up by footsteps above my head that sound like someone was walking down the attic stairs when I'm the only one awake. Finally, my biggest concern is that normally I'm very good at finding information about buildings and their past. So when all of this started to happen, I did some research and I couldn't find a single thing. I couldn't find anything except the listings that we bought the house. I'm at a loss at what to do here. Back when I was nine, me and my friend were having a sleepover. His parents were at a dinner and his brother was out getting stoned somewhere. It was probably 9 p.m. His parents had just called and said that dinner had turned into drinks and they would be out for a little while longer. We were young playing Minecraft on the Xbox 360 when we heard his front door open. It had a very noticeable noise when it opened, very creaky, almost eerie. So we thought, oh, it's probably just your brother and kept playing, thinking nothing of it. Then we hear footsteps on the floor above us. We once again thought nothing of it, seeing as his kitchen was above the basement where we were playing games and his brother was there for a mid high munchie. But then we heard another set of footsteps. We were confused at this point, but we didn't worry as it was either his parents or a stoner friend of his brother's. When we heard scratching at the basement door, we both looked at each other like, is that just me or is there a scratching? He didn't have any pets by the way. So me being the oldest by two months went to go check. I opened the door and there was nothing there. I yelled upstairs to Jim. Jim, you're scaring us, stop it. There was no reply. So I sat back down to carry on playing. Now there was a scratching on the window. We were honestly terrified and we stayed seated. One of us looking at the door, the other looking at the window. Then again, scratching the door. I opened it with a baseball bat in hand and nothing. We barricaded the door and put things in front of the window. We didn't hear anything for the next half an hour and eventually fell asleep. The next morning, his dad came down and knocked on the door and tried to get us into the basement. We took down the barricade and his dad came into the room furious. Why the hell did you guys rip open the screen door? We went upstairs and sure enough, the front door screen was shredded. We tried to convince him that it wasn't us and that the brother had done it to scare us. But what he said next made our blood run cold. Jim wasn't home at all last night. We dropped him off in the city with friends. My friend's house was a half hour away from the city and none of the people at his friend's house had cars. Me and my friend looked at each other and couldn't speak. Needless to say, his parents didn't believe us and they called my parents and me and my friend had to split the cost to have the basement door replaced. It had tons of scratch marks as well and the screen door replaced too. Me and my friend still bring it up to this day whenever we meet.
We were living in a new apartment in the San Francisco Bay Area. I had a one-year-old son, and I was pregnant with my second child. I stayed home during the day with him. One day after lunchtime, I got a knock at the door, and when I looked through the peephole, I saw a guy wearing a shirt with the logo for an appliance company. It was like LG or Whirlpool or something. I opened up the door, and he said he was going around inspecting the appliances of the apartments to see who qualifies for new or replacement stuff. In my naive and pregnant brain state, I let the guy in. My son was super grumpy because it was his nap time, so I totally was not thinking, and honestly barely listening to the guy, just trying to console a fussy toddler until we could nap. I assumed the apartment manager sent him or something. He quickly looked around at our fridge and all that, said thanks, and said we would get a call if we qualified. I mentioned this to my husband when he got home, and he told me it was super weird, and he had never heard anything like that happening before. When we mentioned it to the apartment manager, she said they hadn't sent anyone to do that and wasn't notified that anyone was. I also never got a call from the company, which, duh, they wouldn't even have my phone number. I never found out who the guy really was. He could have been a total scammer who was trying to scope the place to rob us. There were no reports of burglaries in any other apartments, though they were probably smarter than me and didn't let him in. If his intentions were to rob us, we're lucky because we were broke. Even my phone was junk at that point. We had no computer, no tablets, and all that he could have seen were some kids' toys and our old TV. Nothing of much value to anyone. Of course, my thoughts have turned more sinister than that, and I wondered if he had more malicious intent. But because I had a fussy toddler on my hip, he just kept up the ruse of doing his job and left quickly. Who knows, just assumptions at this point. I have no way of knowing what he was doing, but I've always been way more cautious about trusting people just because they are in uniform or whatever. I don't let people I don't know into the house unless I'm expecting them, and I'm so glad this lesson was learned from a situation that ended up harmless. Years ago, I was planning on taking my girlfriend to Montreal for our anniversary. I mentioned it to my friend Fred, who said, man, you have to try this restaurant called En Noir. It's one of those places where you eat in total darkness and all the waiters are blind. I thought it sounded neat, so we decided to go. We didn't bother to make reservations, we just picked a random day and called before we left the hotel to make sure there was room for us. The place was pretty cool. You put all your valuables in a locker, then your blind waiter leads you and your party to a conga line in a table. The place is so dark you can't see your hands in front of your face. I don't think I've ever been anywhere as dark as that. The food was decent, and it was fun experiencing eating sloppily in a crowded restaurant. My girlfriend and I made out a bit just for the thrill of it, doing it so publicly without being noticed. In the middle of the meal, I started hearing a familiar voice out in the restaurant. It sounded exactly like Fred. I told my girlfriend, but she said I was crazy. So I shouted into the total darkness. Hey, Fred. The voice stopped talking, but there was no response. After a moment, I heard the voice again, so I shouted, Hey, Fred Parker. Out of the darkness, I heard him reply. Did someone say my name? My mind was blown. Even though Fred didn't know when my anniversary was, even though he picked a random day, and time to have dinner, even though all three of us lived in a different city from the restaurant, we all managed to show up there for a meal at the exact same time. The funniest thing about it was that we wouldn't go over to join him because we had no idea where he was. We arranged to meet at the coffee shop across the street once we were done with our meals. Weird glitch, massive coincidence, Intentional troll from Fred? Take your pick. Some context before I get to the nitty gritty. I'm a 21 year old guy and I've been exploring abandoned places since I was 16. I've gone all over the US. Hospitals, asylums, warehouses, and at one time even a nuclear power plant. Over the years I've taken different groups of people to these places 
and it seems like every one of them are hardcore believers in the paranormal. I've always been interested in it, but I've never really believed in it. The people I always take are always saying they can hear whispers or seeing ghosts, when I can clearly see the wind is blowing the blinds in a building, and it makes a noise that scares them. There's only been a handful of times where I'm like, yeah, okay, I can't explain what that noise was. And that brings me to what happened last night. So here I am with my roommate, looking up places we haven't been to yet, and this old abandoned hotel pops up. The Hayden Hotel. It looks really cool. I read some stories on Reddit about it, and I really wanted to go. And it turns out it's only an hour and a half away. We geared up and started heading out. This place is in the middle of nowhere in the woods, kind of spooky, but not worse than other places. It's raining pretty lightly, which adds to the aesthetic. We crawl in through one of the windows and start checking the place out. It's a really old looking building, kind of like something I remember seeing on one of my elementary school field trips to some old timey place. My roommate is recording on his GoPro because we have talked about making a YouTube channel, but I'm indifferent. We head to the second floor, and that's when you can actually tell it used to be a hotel. Identical rooms and such. We decide to split up, me in one room, him in the rooms across the hall. I walk around a room a bit. There's a fireplace and an entrance to the back hallway that connects all the bathrooms. Nothing really notable. I go back to the entrance to the front hallway, where I can see my roommate Tyler vlogging in the other room. So I decide to try and look out the window. No matter where I am, I am more nervous about getting caught by an angry neighbor than I am about seeing something paranormal. Something no one I go with seems to share. As I'm looking at the window towards the house or cabins in the distance, I begin to listen to the rain. Despite barely raining outside, it sounds like a hurricane in the house, which is odd. I listen more and begin to notice a pattern to the rain. I figure there must be something on the roof making the water flow strangely. And after a while, I begin to hear something else behind the noise of the rain. I hear footsteps, heel and toe, and again, and then just heel, and then a stop, like someone who was walking stopped all of a sudden to avoid being heard. I instantly look over to the other room and see Tyler sitting down, so I know the noise wasn't him. I ask him if he's heard the footsteps too. He says no and accuses me of making it up to scare him. I've been to places with people that do that and it annoys me to no end. I take exploring seriously because you don't know if you do something, make a noise, shine a light, if it might get you caught and busted for being there. I ended up explaining to Tyler in detail what I heard, and he said something along the lines of, and that's when I heard the footsteps. Then, clear as day to me, I hear a woman ask, can you hear me? I am immediately blinded by Tyler's flashlight, and a, did you hear that? After that, he took what I said a bit more seriously. Tyler later explained to me that he couldn't quite hear what the voice said, but he knew it came from the room I was in. We decided to regroup instead of splitting up, and we headed to a room that I can only describe as an attic. It was on the same floor, but man, did it look like a stereotypical attic you would see in a place like this. We sat down and began to talk about what had just happened, and I started to use my voice recorder on my phone because I didn't trust his GoPro to catch any sound while it was raining like this. Ten minutes later, I started it and Tyler and I were both startled by a tapping noise in the corner of the room that lasted five seconds. The strange thing is, the recording I have, the noise we heard versus the noise we recorded doesn't match up at all. One, the length is completely different. The recording is less than a second, and what we heard was way longer. I've played it for a couple of people, and I've heard its voice, a door shutting or opening where all the doors are shut, stuck. It was something falling, but not a tapping like we heard. After we heard this tapping, we decided to do a walk around the whole place. 
Nothing really eventful happened except Tyler said he heard sobbing coming from the attic room after we left, but that was it. I couldn't find that in the voice recording. After we left, we did a bit more research. Don't know if it's true, but a family used to live there in the 60s, but they boarded up the top floor because they were scared of it. They claimed to hear a woman's voice, sobbing, footsteps, and chains being dragged around the floor. But I'm not sure if the source is reliable. In 2010, my brother kept saying that our house was haunted. He would hear knocks and voices, and my grandma had similar stories, so it all seemed legit. But I was, of course, still skeptical. Well, one day, a couple of months after the first stories, I was watching my four-year-old nephew, and he wanted to go to the basement fridge to get some juice packs. I'm sitting at the kitchen table next to the stair set that goes to the basement, and clearly see him walk down not taking my eyes off him as I'm watching TV with a clear view of the staircase. Keep in mind, there's no other exit or entrance to the basement. 30 seconds later, I see him walk in through the backyard door claiming he just saw Jesus and that he told him to be careful. So I ran and grab him and ask my brother who was sitting on the couch next to the staircase if he saw him come up and he said no. Never heard any weird noises, knocks, or voices again. Looked into it, and the previous owner built and passed on the property. Never got a name from said benevolent spirit, but we all assumed it was the same nice man haunting us. I got kicked out of my house when I was 15, and I had been homeless periodically. And this was in one of those times. It was cold and I didn't want to be sleeping outdoors. So I had to go through social services and they put me into what's called emergency housing. The people who approve of these standards need to be fired yesterday. They sent me to one of the worst neighborhoods ever into a house where I was the only female with four grown men for housemates and there was no one there supervising anything. Half the house was made up of a burnt out porch. There were both rats, roaches of monstrous proportions and usually no heat or hot water. Me and one of the guys ended up sharing a room. Jay, one of our other housemates. I never actually saw this guy and don't know even if he lived there anymore or what. Another one was actually decent, but he drank so much every night that he forgot how keys work and he was usually found passed out on the floor outside the door. And there was this guy from the Caribbean. We used to call him C. This dude was creepy as hell. He had a lot of questionable friends, and they knew that our front door lock generally didn't work, so it wasn't uncommon to just run into random people making grilled cheese sandwiches in the middle of the night when I went up to pee. Me and Jay also liked to mess with C, because one, we were stupid teenagers who didn't realize that these people were dangerous, and two, we were both asses who didn't have much to do, and we liked to screw around with C because we kept telling him to stop lining his teeth up on the windowsill by the kitchen table when they fell out from all that usage. Because, you know, it's not the most appetizing thing to look at when you're eating. So one night, after a new tooth was added, we decided that we would just turn everything into the kitchen upside down and wait for him to come into the kitchen and pretend like it was perfectly normal. We spent four hours doing this and it was almost impressive. It worked too, because he completely lost his mind after we kept telling him that the kitchen looked normal. Also, it should be noted that it was December and we didn't have heat again, but this dude was jittering around the house in his tidy whities swearing like a sprinkler. So C went to his room and he's cursing and slamming things around in there. J goes to the bathroom and I hear C come tearing out when J comes running into the room and slams the door looking terrified. He throws the chain locks on the door and tells me we've got to move the beds and dresses against the door and that C has a sword or something. It was a machete 
and the thing comes blade first through the door, just like The Shining, but with a crazy behind it. So we're frantically trying to move our mattress against the door in the dresser, and we have no other way out besides this window, but we're gonna have to go quietly as hell under his window and run through the woods into the dark to get to the nearest payphone to call the cops. Luckily, C is still making a lot of noise going at the door, so we're able to get past his window and the payphone. The cops were able to get to the house easily because the front door was still unlocked for everyone to come and go as they pleased. He was arrested fairly easily, as he's quite small and there were many cops. C had several outstanding warrants, so he ended up getting locked up for quite a while. J was and is a complete piece of garbage, unrelated to the story, and after this happening, social services thought that maybe this wasn't the best housing arrangement for me, and I was moved elsewhere. I never heard anything else about C after that, as there are a lot of even worse things that happened, and this event was put into the past, and for some reason, it popped into my head. Maybe you didn't want to know this information, but as the story took place, me and Jay had ended up becoming a couple. I had to go to another state for a week, and when I got back, things between Jay and I were off. Long story short, my brother and my best friend, who incidentally is now my boyfriend, we've been friends for over 20 years, and he's also my brother's best friend, found out that Jay had cheated on me during the whole duration I was away. Now, my brother was a year younger than I, and out of everyone I've ever had in my life, he was true, and the true best friend, and we were extremely close. We both had the same friends, played in each other's bands, and were extremely close. So when my brother found out Jay had been cheating on me, he didn't take it kindly. And about a year later, my brother was taken from us. His life was ended. So being that me and my brother were so close, obviously this was the worst thing that ever happened in my life and it devastated me and my family, especially my mum. A few weeks after that, I went to get food with my mum. And who's there? Jay. He found out what happened to my brother and he starts mouthing off that my brother got what he deserved. I'm trying to get this guy, but my mum is begging me to just come with her and leave and I didn't want to upset her anymore. So we went to the parking lot. This guy not only follows us out there, but he also pulls out a sharp instrument on us. I see red, because now he's threatening my mum, and I have this big-ass messenger bag that's crammed full of heavy stuff, and I swing it around as hard as I can and hit him on the side of the arm and head. He ended up dropping the implement, and I kick it away and pushed him as hard as I could and ran to the car. My mum had gotten into the car and started it and backed out, so she could have been readied out of there. All of this happened within a few seconds and we just took off. We didn't call the cops, because my family and I had more than enough to do with them, and they failed us on many times. So if any of you wondering why I didn't like Jay anymore, that is the reason. Last night was very unusual. My girlfriend and I got into a pretty big argument. I was exhausted from it, and I just didn't want to fight anymore for the night. She finally said to me, I don't want to look at your face. So I said, fine, you don't have to. And so at about nine o'clock, I gathered up my pillows and went and laid down on the couch and fell asleep. Then I woke up at 2.30 on the dot almost. I had to use the bathroom. So I went to do that, then came back and laid down on the couch. I just got this weird feeling, and it was just too quiet in the house, so I poked my head into the bedroom to check. My girlfriend was fast asleep, and our ten-month-old son was sound asleep in his crib. I figured, eh, what the hell, I'm over it, and slowly climbed into bed and went to sleep. Now I live in Arizona. It's been kind of rainy and cool the last few days, and to us, it's so nice that our bedroom window was open. There was a nice slow breeze coming in, and it was very relaxing. All of a sudden, I'm awoken by my son. He's crying very loudly, and was standing up in his crib, which is very unusual. Unlike most babies, he slept through the night since he was born. Sure, he makes little noises and rolls around a little, but usually finds his pacifier and dozes back off to sleep. I open my eyes 
to see my girlfriend has already gotten him, and she picks him up and all of a sudden stops crying. I check the time and it's three. I'm like, eh, maybe it's just one of those nights. So she brings him over and puts him between us. He rolls, make noises, but doesn't want to go to sleep. So she makes him a bottle. While he's eating, I doze back off to sleep. Now I'm dreaming, but I'm still in bed, in the same position. It's dark and everything's quiet. Except I can hear someone crying, weeping and moaning, like a woman grieving someone close to her has just passed. It's a long, drawn-out cry, and eerie like the breeze coming through the window. All of a sudden, my eyes jolt open, and there's sweat dripping down my forehead. I can still hear the cry, but this time I know I'm awake, so it's real. I spin around fast, and that's when I see her. She's tall, dressed in all black, like she just came from a funeral. Her face distressed, like she's been mourning for eternity. The wind came through the window behind her, and it's so strong the curtain is blowing like a flag. I see her as she reaches for my son who's lying asleep between me and my girlfriend. So I did what any father would do. I grabbed the blanket with my left hand and came down over with my arm over my son and the blanket covering both of us so that I could hold him tight. All of a sudden, a sheer scream rings out from what I assume to be the woman and a gust of wind hits the window hard and then there's quiet. Nothing but my girlfriend snoring and my son's breathing and my very heavy breath is all that can be heard and a slight little breeze that rattles the blinds on the windows. So I lie awake for a little while and eventually fall asleep clutching my son. I woke up this morning and asked my girlfriend if she heard anything last night. Yeah, I thought I heard someone crying, but it sounded like it was coming from outside. At that point, I knew it was real. Now I'm a big, burly guy with a beard, not afraid of much, and I was a tough kid growing up. But... When I was a kid, I was afraid of one thing. After I went to a friend's house, and his uncle told us the story of La Llorona, a Mexican folklore tale that I always believed was real. I never really wanted to stay outside after dark, and never slept with my window open. Of course, I never told anyone, because like I said, I'm tough and didn't want any of my friends to think I'm a coward. But she's real and I'll be keeping a much closer eye on my son from now on. I always was a believer in the paranormal, but at this point in time, it was more something that I was afraid of. My grandma's house was always one of those places that gave me the creeps, not because it was old, as it was built in the 90s, but because my grandma openly admitted that she heard weird things. Of course, she was always pretty nonchalant about it, but I was typically pretty horrified at the creepy things she'd tell me. My grandma always had an interest for dolls, and of course, clowns. Mostly everywhere you'd look, you'd have at least one doll. At the time, I was about 13, and I'm 19 now, and this story has been one that I've always shared and still get chills from. I had visited her house during the summer, before her and my grandpa had retired, and I was babysitting my three younger cousins of 11, 9, and 7. We had the house to ourselves, and they were semi-early risers. I'd fallen asleep on the couch that night, and woke up to them asking me if I was up. I got up to make a bowl of cereal, and one of them finally asks, Hey, did you hear that music playing a little bit ago? I shook my head, and pretty much brushed it off until a few minutes later when I heard it. Chills descended down my spine, and I sort of cocked my head to listen better. But it was quiet, so I couldn't hear very well. I, albeit creeped out, just tried to ignore it. We all moved into the living room, and I threw some cartoons on the TV to lighten the mood and eat my food. It wasn't even 15 minutes before I heard it again. It registered in my head, by that point, that it sounded like one of those wind-up jack-in-the-boxes. It sounded slower, and a bit more decrepit, but I knew it was for sure that. I checked in every single room, turned off the living room TV, 
checked all the phones and laptops to make sure the volume was off, and made sure all the TVs in the house were off. Everything was off, or at least silenced. We sat in deafening silence just to make sure we weren't insane, or hearing a TV or something. We waited a while, and it took about 20 minutes, and we heard it again. This time, it was louder than the other times, and we were sitting in the computer room all crammed onto the small daybed, with our knees pretty much tucked at our chests. We had shut the bedroom door at least 90%, and it started to sound like the noise was creeping down the hallway. For reference, the hallway wasn't very long or narrow. Two people could probably stand side by side, and it was only about 15 feet long before it opened into the living room at the end of the hall. And there, there's a bathroom. If you're facing the living room, back to the bathroom, aka the end of the hallway. And then a bedroom to the right, and my grandmother's bedroom to the left. And then about three feet ahead is the computer room. We watched the bedroom door push open the very slightest bit, like hardly a hair. And the noise sounded as if we were standing outside the door. Of course, I noped out of there and called my grandmother, who sent my family friend and her friend to visit. They stayed about 45 minutes, checked out the house, but of course, it was radio silence the entire time they were there. After they left, we retreated back to the computer room and my cousin decided to play the Xbox, and we all just sat watching. It was a while before it happened again, but it did, and it was relatively loud now. I took the two younger cousins and we went outside for a walk on the train tracks, just to get out of the house. The oldest of the three insisted he wasn't afraid, and stayed inside to play his game. Not even ten minutes pass, and I hear someone hauling ass down the rocks on the tracks, and I see it's my cousin, who's wearing my grandmother's flip-flops, and he looks absolutely horrified. I asked him, what he saw and he wouldn't say. He insisted he didn't want to talk about it, and that he was just really scared and wanted to be outside for a while. He told me that he put on her shoes because they were the closest things he could grab, and he was too scared to find his sneakers. I haven't asked him again about what he saw, but I feel like I really should. We did speak to my grandmother about what happened, and she just said maybe it was something in the attic hearing a jack-in-the-box in the attic is far worse, since something in the attic would have been winding it up. I honestly don't think I'll ever forget this event, despite all the weird things that have happened since then. My grandmother has passed, but my dad recently visited and confirmed that he also believes there's something paranormal there, and he certainly can be quite the skeptic. I'm a 30-year-old female, and I had a unique childhood. Both of my parents were farriers slash horseshoers, and I and my two younger siblings were homeschooled. Also a fairly religious family as well. My dad doesn't believe in the paranormal, but my mum was always more open-minded, and she loved watching the latest episode of Ghost Hunters with us kids. Now, my earliest memories of home were pleasant and happy. I felt safe and comfortable in all areas of the house, even the basement, which is dark and gloomy. But that's where the wood stove is, and my dad's office. My mum loved sitting in the swivel chair by the wood stove and read a good book on cold winter nights. And when I became an avid bookworm, I picked up the same habit. I would happily snuggle up in the chair prop my feet up on the old log piece that my dad used to chop kindling, and sip a hot cup of tea while reading whichever one of my mum's books she wasn't currently reading. Gradually, I don't know exactly what, that feeling of safety and peacefulness changed to unease, mild paranoia to downright fear of every shadow and creak. When I turned seven or eight, I had to move into one of the spare bedrooms in the basement, so my little brother could have his own room. There was not a single night in that room that I wasn't uneasy. It only had one window, and it was one of those small rectangular basement windows at ground level. 
I have always had to get up at least once in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And this was a creepy ordeal every time. I would lay there in bed, working up the courage to get out from under the covers until my bladder made up my mind for me. Then I would get out of bed and scurry out of my room and across the basement and up the stairs as quickly as I could in the dark. It wasn't completely dark as the light above the stove was always kept on, but that was dim and only offered enough light to keep me from tripping over anything. Every time I went up those stairs at night, I had the feeling that there was something behind me that would grab me if I wasn't fast enough. My mind always conjured up the same image of a tall black figure, shaped like it was in some sort of robe. Have you ever watched Lord of the Rings? Picture the wraiths, but completely black, with a featureless, solid shadow. I never actually saw it. But this was and still is the same image that came to mind when I felt like I was being watched or followed. Now I know what you're thinking. A little kid that was just forced to move into a dark basement is very likely going to feel scared and jumpy. But this fear has lasted to this day. I struggled nightly with that run up until I moved out to join the army at 22. Eventually, the only place in the house I felt comfortable after sundown was the couch in the living room, under the picture window. I gave up reading in the basement chair, even on the coldest nights, because I couldn't focus over the feelings of unease, and started reading on the living room couch instead. Some nights I would just sleep on the couch, telling my dad that I fell asleep reading my book. I don't know why I never talked to my parents about what was going on. When I was 19, my mum passed away from cancer. We were all in shock, and us kids didn't really know how to handle it. My older sister and five-year-old niece moved back in with us, and babysitting my niece and watching her grow up was a pleasant distraction from the pain. Now, while living in the house, save for two occasions, I never saw or heard anything concrete as far as paranormal. That's the strange part. I was plagued with fear, nightmares, and lights never working when I needed them. The two solidly unexplained experiences that I had were surprisingly pleasant. The first one happened when I was six, and that's a story for another time. But the second experience that I had was the most incredible. It was a few months after my mum had passed away, and I was leading my mum's miniature stallion Fred to the pasture to enjoy some fresh grass. Fred was always a one-person horse. He was very attached to my mum, and he merely tolerated us kids to some extent. Sometimes I swear the little guy even got jealous of us kids when it came to my mum. I remember one time my mum was in the field with Fred relaxing and sharing Cheez-Its with him, and I reached into the box to take a few Cheez-Its, and Fred immediately pinned his ears back and chased me out the field. Anyway, while I was leading Fred to the field, he was his usual frisky self, pacing around trying to nip at my legs and hands, trying to twist himself around to kick me halfway across the yard. When I heard my mum's voice next to me, it was as clear as though she was actually there. It was only three words, which carried a tired and mildly exasperated tone of voice. Fred, knock it off. Immediately, Fred stopped trying to bite me and walked alongside me as docile and gently as ever. I know it was her. If Fred hadn't responded to the voice, I would have told myself that it was simply a manifestation of my grief, but he heard it too. I know he did. I've lived and handled horses all my life. I've grown up with this horse. I've known his attitude inside and out. And I know the only person he listened to was my mum. The next week, something else happened, this time to my younger sister. She came outside to me crying while I was doing chores. And she told me that she had gone into dad's room and opened my mum's porcelain jewelry box to look inside and felt and heard a loud, heavy breath in her ear. She was so upset I ran inside, walked into the centre of Dad's bedroom, and stood there and demanded that whatever it was had to leave. 
but I don't believe that this incident had been my mother. Why would she comfort me but scare my sister? No. I believe whatever did that was the same thing responsible for my perpetual unease. I kept my troubles mostly to myself. I didn't even talk to my siblings about it until we grew up and moved out. Apparently we all had creepy experiences, and none of us decided to speak of them until we were adults. My brother mentioned a few times that weird things have happened in the house, but has never given any details as to what. He lives there now with my dad, in the basement room next to my old room. I don't know how he does it, because that room used to scare me even more than my own. My little sister told me that once my brother joined the army, things changed in the house for her too. I'd already been in the army for two years, so it was just her and my dad. She told me that she heard strange sounds and felt like she was being watched whenever she was alone. She said that sometimes it was so bad she would sit outside in the driveway until dad got home. Now I've always tried my best to rationalize it as much as possible. I've always told myself I was just a scaredy cat, that being afraid of the dark was totally normal, that the lights didn't work for me at night due to faulty wiring and so on. I even convinced myself of these things until I joined the army. My first duty was stationed in Germany, on a converted German base living in an old Nazi barracks. Should be creepy, right? Nope. Slept like a baby every night in that place, wasn't creeped out in the least. I could watch horror movies at night and not have nightmares, something I could never do before. Because back home, everything horror related gave me nightmares. I even got nightmares from the Scooby-Doo movies on the island. I waited about a year before taking leave to visit home. A week before leaving, the nightmares started. Every night I would have nightmares about that house most of them centering around the basement. I would wake up tired and scared and go back to sleep. This happened every time I went home to visit over the next few years. I still have nightmares about that house. I have no explanation for it. I didn't suffer any childhood trauma that would cause me a lot of anxiety. I had a happy childhood with loving parents and a lot of animals. Perhaps I was just a wimpy kid with an overactive imagination. But if that's the case, why am I still afraid of that house as an adult? Why do I still have nightmares about it? As an adult, I live for horror, and I'll stay up late watching horror movies and YouTube videos about ghosts and cryptid and sleep just fine. Hell, I even live in a freaking haunted apartment and still feel safe and happy. Most situations I find a rational, non-paranormal explanation for, but my dad's house will always be a mystery to me. The reason I'm sharing this is because I've been thinking about it more than usual. My husband and I want to buy a farm in the next year, and we don't think anything less than 20 acres. My dad's house is on only one acre, far too small for us, not to mention the house needs a lot of work. Yet my mind keeps wandering back to it. It's like it's trying to drag me back. I'm afraid yet intrigued, and I'm curious and desperate for answers. Half of me wants to go back to restore the place, and the other half wants to run as far away as possible and never go back. When I was 13, I was home sick with the flu. I was walking past one of the windows when I saw the mailman walk across the street. Out of nowhere, a car came and hit him. The driver got out the car and started attacking the mailman repeatedly. It looked like he was doing it with a sharp weapon. He stopped and ran off down the street. I called my mom and told her what I saw, and she thought I was hallucinating. She told me to go lay down since I had a fever of around 103. When she got home, she noticed that I was obviously rattled from what I saw. Turns out the guy lived right around the corner from us and was severely deranged. They found him later that day. He was committed and his family moved out of town. The mailman lived and was back to delivering a few months later. This happened a few years ago, and we don't know exactly who this man was, but it still scared me senseless. When I was around 13, I used to have a bed right under my bedroom window. 
It was also around the time my dog was brought inside because she was too old to stay out. At the time, we didn't have a screen covering, and we now do. So the window could easily be opened and there was no barrier. I always left my window open during the day to let in fresh air, then close and lock it when it started getting dark. My house is surrounded by forest, not very thick, but still thick enough that you can't see clearly through it. It's completely normal hearing strange noises at night, because things like bears or stray dogs or even our former neighbor's chickens that would roam around our yard. So when I heard something shuffling around my window, I didn't pay it much mind and continued playing video games. Not 10 minutes later, I heard something hit against it. I thought it may have been a June bug. When they hit a window, they can sound like rocks, so I ignored it and the knocking kept on going, but I just kept ignoring it, and it finally stopped. Fast forward to 2 a.m. I was finally sitting down and going to sleep when I hear breathing, very faint, enough to miss if my room wasn't silent. I heard something drag down my window like a stick or a finger. It did it a few times, and that was enough for me. I jumped out of bed and ran into my dad's room. I told him that there was something at my window and he immediately came to look. We turned out the lights so he could see better, but there was nothing. I told him what I heard and he said we would take a look in the morning. We did just that and my stomach churned. Under my window, there were two different foot tracks, one back and forth besides the generator and one that was back and forth directly under my window. There were even cigarette butts laying around near some bushes, like he had crouched there and waited. The foot tracks led towards the woods. We have neighbors that live through the woods and down the hill. They are very trashy. So we chalked it up to one of them coming up here drunk. Though what scared me the most about all this was the fact that when I went to open my window later that day, I found it was unlocked. I forgot to lock it the night before. He could have gotten in without issue. I live in England, in a two-story flat, and I've always believed in the paranormal, but my dad does not believe in any type of ghost or anything like that. I never thought that the flat was haunted. However, as I got older, I started to feel uncomfortable by myself, and I saw shadows downstairs out of the corner of my eye. Now, there is an attic directly above our second floor, but there is no way for us to enter it, as you cannot access it from this flat. The only way to access this attic is by having a specific key that can open the attic, as it is council flats, which is above all of our neighbors' houses. However, the attic above my flat is the only one which is blocked off, and there is no way to enter it. I have the last flat on the end of the 18 council flats, and there are no neighbors above us, just the attic, which none of us can access without the key, and they would still not be able to get above our flat. One night two years ago, all of the family in bed, and it was about 3 a.m. All of a sudden, I hear something crash above me. It was so loud that it woke up all of my family, and we got up and stood on the landing together. After that bang, we heard another three loud footsteps and the sound of something being dragged behind them. It was so scary, as we knew that no one can physically be up there. My dad was not convinced that it was a ghost. He thought someone had somehow gotten into the attic. So he went outside to check if the communal attic door was opened. I followed him outside and it was completely padlocked, shut with heavy chains around the lock. I tried to explain to him, how can anyone be up there in our part of the attic when it's blocked off and impossible to get into? We came back into the house and we were all quite shaken up. My brother was quite young and was able to get sleep, but I stayed up all night and found it hard to sleep. After this experience, I started to smell old cigarette smell every time I would enter near my toilet and it smelled so odd. After that event, me, my brother and my mum went away on holiday while my dad had to stay and work. He told me he slept with headphones on every night as he felt uncomfortable by himself. So 
tell me, what were these noises? Does my family still have no idea what they were? And since, we've heard many a strange noise. This was about seven years ago, when I was 16. I lived in this big old white house that was built in 1914. The house had three floors. The middle floor was the main floor, with the living room, kitchen, bathroom, and one bedroom. The top floor just had three more bedrooms. The bottom floor, the basement, looked like it had been a full apartment at one point. There were three rooms, what was supposed to be a kitchen and what was supposed to be a bathroom. Everything was unfinished besides one room that was mostly finished. It lacked carpet, but had drywall and paint. In this room, my family kept some storage items and a treadmill. The basement always gave me bad vibes, but I assumed that was just because it was unfinished and looked abandoned. But after school one day, I decided to go walk on the treadmill and watch a movie on my tablet with my headphones. The movie that I was watching was a favorite of mine, and I've watched it a hundred times. About 45 minutes in, it came to a scene that I knew was silent. I even rewatched it later to confirm the scene was completely silent. Then I heard the deepest, bone chilling growl I've ever heard, and it was right behind my ear, like someone was just over my shoulder. I was wearing headphones, so even if it was something in the movie, there was no way that it would come out of just one headphone. I tried not to act afraid after that, because I believed that this was a truly dark entity that could possibly feed off fear. I calmly turned off the tablet, slowly turned around the room, and left, going upstairs. I haven't told many people this story, nor mentioned it to my family. After I got upstairs, it almost felt surreal, like it didn't really happen. A couple of months after that, my dad's girlfriend moved in with her kids, and they needed more bedrooms, so as the oldest kid, I went to live in the basement in that room, because again, it was the only finished room down there, so I could have my own space. I've never had any encounter after that. I slept with a nightlight on for about a week before I could sleep in the dark, because I was afraid of that room. After a while, I became really comfortable, and honestly, it's been one of my favorite bedrooms I've had. Could there have been some sort of entity that's gone now? Whatever it is. I've been fishing the backwaters for about a year and a half now, both in canoe and on boat. The first few times I was out there, however, I was just fishing from land near Biscam Bay. Keep in mind, this is not far out wilderness. I walked at most one kilometer from the nearest walking trail through the mangroves to find a fully loaded establishment built from both driftwood and wood brought in from the mangroves. I'm talking a three-story loft with a bar and stools on the first floor, a ladder leading up to a platform midway through the canopy where you can access a bathroom, which is a hole in the floor, and the third floor, a viewing platform with a sofa 20 feet above ground. The only way up these makeshift floors is through a shoddy handcrafted driftwood ladder. I asked my buddy, how is any of this possible? And he said, well, I've never seen the man responsible for this and nor I am sure I really want to meet him, considering we're trespassing in someone's luxury mangrove suite. I thought it'd be best to get the hell out of there. A little backstory. I was a strip dancer for six years. I worked in many cities and clubs. At the time of this story, I wasn't a rookie. I was very well versed in the industry. At the time this took place, I was about 20 or 21. It was also in Texas, at one of the upscale clubs, and I never imagined something like this would happen in this place, but apparently I was wrong. I started my shift at 6 p.m. I liked to get there early, meet some of my regulars before the crowd came in. It was about 8.30 to 9, and this really good looking Kai came in with some friends. They were all older, 40 to 45, I grabbed some of my hustle friends and we went and sat with them. It wasn't hard to convince these guys into a VIP room with bottled service. 
but this is where it went kind of weird. The guy I was talking to wanted a separate room just for us. I thought maybe because his friend seemed rowdy and wanting to party hard, he wanted to have a more relaxed area. I wasn't complaining because that meant I wouldn't have to share my cut of the room. So stupid me saw dollar signs and went in. We got two bottles of Dom Perignon, some mixed drinks and shots. Now, a lot of these guys that come into the clubs really want to let loose and brought substances too. These guys had just about everything and I was definitely a party girl at the time. So I partook in some of these, but I also wasn't stupid. So at the time we were all hanging out in one room together. I took a little hit of something and continued drinking. After we were all hyped up and ready to party, my guy pulled me over into the other room. This guy was 6'4", obviously worked out a lot and was attractive. I, on the other hand, without my heels, was 5'6", and like 120. I sat on his lap and started talking to him and laying my moves down to get him to empty his wallet. We were having a really good conversation and my bouncers were really good about checking up on the girls in the rooms because they are pretty secluded on the second floor. After 20 minutes of talking, something snapped and all of a sudden he literally puts his hands around my neck, lifted me up and slammed me against the back of the couch. The couch backs were tall and padded so it wouldn't have been heard on the other side without the music. I was frozen in fear. After almost three years of dancing, I'd never been in this situation. He started calling me names, spat in my face, and his grip around me would get tighter. He would then feel me take a deep breath, like I was going to scream. Luckily, there were also VIP rooms across the large overlook, and a bouncer noticed me kicking and flailing. I faintly remember all of the bouncers running into the room. They had to pry me out of his hands. When I was finally back sitting on the couch, they had him on the floor outside the room and his buddies acted like they didn't even know him. My manager grabbed me and carried me like a baby to the dressing room, asked if I needed any medical, and I said no and that I was just shaken up. His buddies talked to my manager and basically gave me guilt money for this happening. Apparently he was going through some rubbish divorce and snapped on me instead of his ex. This started off a year ago at 4am, when I heard what sounded like someone knocking on my bedroom window. There are no trees near my house or anything else that could possibly be hitting my window. Not only that, but it definitely has the unique sounds of human knuckles tapping on glass. I was terrified and didn't go to open the blinds on my window because I imagined that if I did, I would see a horrifying face staring at me. So I went to sleep and tried to ignore it. It carried on for another half an hour, on and off tapping. It happened every night at the exact same time for weeks after that. But then it seemed to stop, until a month later when I once again, between 2 and 4 a.m., heard the same distinct tapping on my window. I immediately remembered it from before, but this time I grabbed my knife and opened the blinds. I couldn't see anything which was weird, but I was relieved there was no one staring at me. Ever since then, it happened once every few weeks, or sometimes a few times per week. Always when my blinds are closed, until about three weeks ago when I was texting my friend with my back to the window, with the open blind, and I heard it again. Louder because of the open blind. I was terrified to turn around and I immediately called my friend, who I'd already told about it before, and explained what was happening. He laughed and said I should turn around. I did, and once again there was nothing there, so I said goodbye to my friend and went to sleep. Now it would have been fine if it had just stayed with the knocking and nothing else, but ever since that night three weeks ago I've not heard a single knock at my window. Instead I now hear footsteps in the attic, above my room, directly above where my window is. This obviously freaked me out a bunch, because my first thought was that either whoever it was had been knocking at my window has found a way into my house via the attic or there's an actual person living in my house. I played it off as just sounds that a house makes and turned it into a joke on my Instagram of attic man. But I noticed a few days ago that gradually over the past three weeks, 
Since I first heard the footsteps, they've been getting closer and closer to the hatch that leads to my attic, which very unfortunately just happens to be directly above my door. Ever since then, whenever I have to leave my room at night for any reason, I always nervously look up at the hatch first to make sure it is still closed. But tonight is different. About half hour ago, I needed to go out of my room to the bathroom, which happens to be right next to my room. But as soon as I opened my door, I felt a very strong feeling of fear that someone was staring at me from somewhere. I forced myself to go to the bathroom to brush my teeth anyway. But whilst I was in the bathroom, I started hearing the footsteps again, right next to the hatch in the attic. I ran back to my room and closed the door and got into bed. Then just recently, I heard this light thud outside my door just as if someone had dropped down from the attic and into the hallway. I was terrified and messaged my friends, but just like my family, they're all asleep as it's 3.40 in the morning. I turned out all the lights in my room except for one, hoping that if there was something out there, it wouldn't notice me. For about five minutes after that, I could hear footsteps and the floorboards creaking along the hall, and then go down the stairs, and then come back up. After that, they stopped. And instead, I can now hear scratching and tapping sounds in all of my walls. Also, for about a minute, I actually heard a weird sound of what sounds like monks chanting, which kept getting louder until it was loud enough that I was sure I wasn't imagining it. I'm a 30 year old female and we live in a small town in South Africa in an area that's quite susceptible to robberies and break-ins. Now our bedroom used to be the old carport, so it's closest to the street, passing the front of the house where we have a big ass tree in the middle of our driveway. The street lights tend to be broken a lot, so a lot of the times it's completely dark out front. Now this particular night, or maybe early morning, it was definitely after midnight, I heard a strange noise. I didn't know whether it was a dream or not since I used light sleeping medication, but it sounded so clear. The sound of a stick or something being dragged along the entire length of the side of the front fence, up and down, up and down. In my stupor, I wanted to get up and go have a look at what or who it was that was making the noise, but I didn't. And after a while, just kind of fell asleep again. The next morning when we were getting ready for work, I told my husband what I'd heard. Now he said that he didn't hear anything like that himself, but since he's quite a heavy sleeper, that's not really odd. But that his friend who lives just two houses down from the road told us a similar story just the week before. The difference here is that he actually went out with his firearm to confront whoever was in the street and found some weird skinny guy in front of his gate, holding a machete, dragging it along the fence. He yelled at him to get off their property, but the guy just stood there seeming to be quite stoned. He didn't even register that someone was there yelling at him. It was only after our friend actually fired a warning shot that he ran off. We heard later that apparently the skinny guy is some homeless person that's been taking illegal substances and wandering around the neighborhood causing trouble and that the police were looking for him for quite a while but I haven't seen the guy nor heard the sound or anything about that since. I'm fairly sure it's the same guy, but I'd rather not find out. I need to preface this by letting you know that this is not my story. My boyfriend told me this story about what happened to his friends recently. Last week, my boyfriend went over to his childhood friend's home, Luis, to buy some headlights from him. He lives with his mom and brother, David. Luis and my boyfriend were in his backyard talking when they started speaking about David. My boyfriend asks him how David's doing. Luis was very hesitant to answer and kind of fumbles with his words. He tells him, I don't know, he's been in the hospital twice the past six months. He's there now. Two days ago, he woke up with his tongue swollen and couldn't get it back in. My boyfriend is like, what? Did he have an allergic reaction or something? No, he's not allergic to anything that he knows of. He literally just woke up. 
And, uh, I know it's gonna sound crazy, but I don't know if you're gonna believe me, but David's first hospital trip was because he fell down the basement stairs, but he said it felt like someone pushed him. He woke up with scratches all over his back a few nights after he returned from the hospital. Louise continued telling him about the day his brother fell down the stairs. No one was home but David and their two dogs. David called their mum to ask for a ride to the hospital. His ankle was swollen and couldn't put pressure on it, and he needed to get it checked out. Louis said that he was at a friend's house smoking and arrived home a few minutes after his mum. As everyone left the house, he was the only one home. He doesn't know if it was because he was still high, but he felt like David or someone was in the room with him in the basement. He could hear talking and someone walking around downstairs. With David being in the hospital right now, their two dogs flat out refused to go down to the basement. They will whine and pace back and forth towards the basement stairs. I'm not a huge believer in the paranormal, as I was when I was younger. I'm more of there has to be an explanation and I need to see it to believe it type of person now, but this definitely gave me chills. My boyfriend has always been a believer and we definitely do have some weird stuff that we both can't explain. My name is Thomas. I'm a 33 year old man that lives in Baltimore City, better known as Beemore or Bodymore in the urban area where it's dangerous. But when you live your whole life somewhere, you tend to adapt to your area. The following story happened five years ago when I was 28. I was walking to my buddy's place at about 10 p.m. to buy some green. His house was about a 15 minute walk away and on the way back, I nipped into the store because I had my cousin's independence card. So I definitely was gonna buy some munchies for a post smoke snack. But on my way back, I saw a white car drive past me and pulled up a side street a block away. Mind you, I had my earphones in but didn't have anything playing in case someone tried anything funny. When I got to the block where the car was, a guy hopped out the car and tried to catch up with me. I started to feel unnerved by his ever growing proximity. And when he was within earshot, I heard him utter something. I then took out one of the earbuds and with an annoyed tone said, what do you want? He instantly shot me a fierce reply to not speak to him that way. And it was at that moment, I saw a silver firearm that he was clutching in his coat. I had a bag of junk food in my hand and a bag of green in my shoe. Without missing a beat, he said, where's the money? I then realized I was being robbed. I stopped in my tracks. I don't have any money. I've just got this bag of green. It was at that moment when someone else hopped out the car. He was armed too and went onto the right side of me. I was now standing with two armed men at either side of me and did the only logical thing I could think of. I took off my shoe and threw the bag of green to the ground while sputtering, that's all I've got. With a fierce reply, he shouted at me to put my shoe back on. As I started to, I looked around. There were plenty of people watching me nearby, watching all of this go down. The guy on the left then went, Yo, if you don't pull out a dollar, I'ma shoot you. My fight or flight kicked in. With no money on me at all and nothing to appease the robbers unsatisfied with their loot, I pulled my pants up a little more because I was preparing to run. And before I could say anything else, sprinted up the street. I was only three minutes away from my house. As I bolted, I passed people wearing crazy expressions as they'd seen the entire ordeal. When I got two blocks from my house, I ran through a parking lot and headed by a gate that had a lot of high bushes and trees and caught my breath because I couldn't run anymore. But I didn't stay long because I was still scared and didn't know if I was still being chased. So I got the hell up and jogged the rest of the way to my house. Once I composed myself and made sure I wasn't followed, I sat down and told my little eight year old cousin just how dangerous it was at night in Baltimore City after dark. Oddly enough, 
I was telling him earlier that day how dangerous it was, and telling him a story of how I was robbed on another occasion. Safe to say, I no longer try and go out after dark. There is one strange thing that happened during my childhood that I know was not a dream, nightmare, or a sleep paralysis episode. We lived in a tiny row home, and I shared the attic with my brother Dave, who was a year younger than me. The room was split with an open staircase, and Dave slept on one side of the room and I on the other. There was a wall light at the top of the stairs that we usually kept on at night, and it happened to be turned on the night when something unearthly dropped in for a visit. I was about eight at the time, when I woke up in the middle of the night to a loud and almost deafening electronic humming. Not unusual was that my thin blanket was covering my head, which is something I did regularly when I went to sleep. Highly unusual, in addition to the humming sound, was that I could clearly see the shadow of a three-fingered claw-like hand moving up and down above my head. I was terrified. To my young mind, it was the devil. I could conjure up no other explanation. Who's there? I managed a few times, but the non-human hand just continued to get closer to my head and then further away. It was like it was performing some odd religious rite. I could not gather up the courage to remove the blanket that was over my head to face whatever was attached to the claw. But I did peek out of it slightly in my brother's direction. Dave appeared sound asleep, and I started to yell his name. Dave didn't budge, but that could have been due to the electronic humming sound which I immediately realized was muffling my voice. My terror grew greater as I started to scream for my parents. Nobody came. I turned my focus back to the claw-like hand and tried to communicate with it again, but it just continued to move up and down with thick, outstretched fingers that came to points at the tips above my head. I closed my eyes and started to pray. Every now and then I would open my eyes to see whether the hand was still there. It was still there, and I should have known it was still there because the humming sound was constant. I prayed and prayed and prayed. The next thing I knew, it was bright outside and morning. But it wasn't like I had a nightmare and woke up. It was like time had passed between the moment I was praying and the time I woke up. It wasn't like waking from a nightmare at the breaking of day. Something had happened late the night before. I passed out somehow. Hours went by and then I awoke. The entire event lasted about 20 minutes and I was wide awake the whole time. There was no doubt it was not a dream. Of course, when I told my mother about it in the morning, she did not believe it was real. I argued with her for about 30 minutes but she insisted that I only had a dream. It crossed my mind at the time that I am only a kid and no one is going to believe me. As the years went by, I sometimes told the story to friends and family members, and many times the response was the same as my mother's. It must have been a dream. Well, for over 10 years after the event, the only explanation I could muster was that the thing in my room was something satanic. I've always known that something was in my room that night, and that it could not have been a dream. It was not until the late 1980s or early 1990s that my opinion about the event started to change. The first time I had any knowledge that some people believed in extraterrestrial beings were coming to Earth was in the late 70s or early 80s. I'd watched science fiction films growing up as such, like Earth vs. Flying Saucers and War of the Worlds. I even went to see Close Encounters of a Third Kind in a movie theatre sometime in 78, but I never seriously entertained the possibility that beings from other worlds were actually coming here during the first 10 or 11 years of my life, in either 1979 or 1980. 
my father was watching an episode of the TV series In Search Of, a documentary that was hosted by Leonard Nimoy. The episode speculated on the possibility that beings from other worlds were coming to Earth in flying saucers. It was the first time I had ever been presented with information that extraterrestrials could actually be real. I was fascinated, but I didn't really know what I thought about it until years later. After watching shows on television in the late 80s and early 90s about people who claimed to have been abducted by aliens, a bell started sounding off in my head. The Night of the Claw finally started to make sense, right down to the electronic humming sound. It wasn't Lucifer who appeared in my bedroom that night. It was an alien. Even though I embraced this new concept, I still had some doubts about an extraterrestrial reality. It was simply too fantastic. Besides, I would never be able to prove conclusively to anyone that an alien had indeed infiltrated my childhood sleeping quarters back in the 1970s to lull me into some weird shock because I was the only one awake to experience the event. I knew something very odd had happened. I knew for a fact there was something in my room that night, no matter what anyone else said. And I knew there was no way, no how, that the event was a dream. I still know it and I'll always know it. I also believe there's a strong possibility that something more happened that night, but I have no conscious memory of it. I know for sure that when I was praying to God to save me that night, I was far from sleepy. I was frightened beyond belief and not at all feeling like a little shut eye. During my life, I've had a number of strange experiences happen to me. The first, I was in bed sleeping, when I had a dream that I woke up in my bed. It's a loft bed about six foot five feet up, and I saw a very tall figure of a man standing at the foot of my bed. He had long, sharp fingers and an arm that reached close to his knees. He was about 12 feet in height and had to hunch over his head or it would hit the ceiling and he scared the hell out of me. He reached for my leg and grabbed it with his sharp fingers and tried to pull me from the bed. But I held onto the rails of the bed and he was too weak to pull me free. His claw-like fingers raked down my calf as I woke up. Immediately, I sat up and realized my leg had a long scratch going down from just below the knee to my ankle and it was bleeding. The second, is my old house had a staircase with a window at foot level that overlooked the driveway. As I walked up the stairs, I'd sometimes see a large, bulky black dog looking at me, sitting from the outside window from the corner of my eye. It had glowing yellow-orange eyes, but would be gone if I looked directly at it. I also saw it in the laundry room of the house, but it again vanished when I looked directly at it. I saw it seven or eight different times, all by the stairs except for one time in the laundry room. I never told a soul, but this year two of my brothers told me that they had seen the dog by the stairs as well. We had three dogs at that house who had free reign of the property, but none of them looked remotely like the beast we saw. I'm confident it was not a real dog, because the real dogs who lived there chased any and every animal away religiously. If it's relevant, both the laundry room and the stairs were added to the house after my family moved in. The third occasion. After staying a night at my friend's house, I woke up to see a silver orb about the size of a softball rolling around on the ceiling. It rolled a bit, then rolled right into the ceiling, and I never saw it again. I later read about something called the Burt's Mystery Sphere, which resembles what I saw was larger than the one I saw. My next event happened when I was 19. This one starts with a very special and occasional phenomenon that happens while I was in college. While laying down for bed, I feel the presence of someone laying behind me or above me. When I slept on my back or side, following the weird feeling, I'd hear a woman or young girl's voice whisper something in my ear. It was typically either my name or something along the lines of, don't sleep, wake up, stay here. 
Then I'd get this feeling like a gentle touch or something cold touch my back that would make me jump. After time passed, the incidents increased in frequency. After a semester at school, which I didn't like, I took a semester off and moved back home. During my time, this would happen every other week or so, and the wake up, don't sleep message did not change. But things really picked up when I went to a different school the following semester. I've had these whispers in my ear and the weird feeling of someone behind me almost nightly. After about two weeks of this, the voice changed from a woman or girl to an old man. He spoke a language I didn't understand and was intensely creepy. I also got a very strong feeling of evil when it happened. He never spoke to me in more than two or three words. Then I began to get sleep paralysis when I slept on my back, which I did to avoid the creepy voice. My two sleep paralysis episodes featured a large demonic creature breathing heavily and running towards my bed, and the sound of hurt animals as well. At this point, I was too freaked out and consulted Reddit and was advised to try and tell the voices to go away. That same night I felt the presence behind me and told it loudly to go away before it spoke. It did not speak, but the room felt lighter. So I settled back in and felt the presence again a few minutes after, followed by a very intense sensation similar to an ice cube being pressed against my back. I told it to go away again and the ice cube sensation then happened three times in rapid succession. So I sat up loudly and told it to piss off and the presence seemed to disappear. As I laid back down to try to sleep, I felt the bed tilt towards the wall and felt as though I was gonna be dumped onto the floor head first. I bolt upright and the bed is still lying flat. I look towards the center of the room and see a very large purple disc with some green on it floating from near the door towards the sliding glass door to the balcony of the apartment. It was hard to describe, shaped like a rounded disc about four feet thick and about six to seven feet in diameter. It wasn't glowing. It almost looked like it was made of colored shadow, but it was not transparent and floated towards the balcony straight through the glass door. I was in awe, but not afraid. After it left, the room felt lighter and safer. I have not had a single strange experience since then. And this happened in late September of 2018. When I was 18, I moved into a very old house with friends that were being renovated into two apartments by a friend's family. The upstairs was done and most of us slept up there waiting for the bottom floor to be finished. So the rest could move into that. We were young and partied a lot. The house had a front porch with an entrance where you walked into a small foyer with a door to the downstairs apartment, a door to the basement and a long wooden staircase leading to the upstairs apartment. One night after partying, my boyfriend and I decided to sleep on the floor. That was the entrance right behind the first floor apartment door almost directly above the basement stairs. At about 3 a.m. or so, I started hearing someone on the wooden basement stairs. It was a very noticeable heavy shoe sound climbing the stairs. To make it even more strange, I could hear the sound of what sounded like a wind chime. It freaked me out somewhat, but not in a paranormal way. I honestly thought someone was there and maybe drunk. So I tried to wake up my boyfriend, but he wouldn't budge. So I actually got up, went out to the front entrance and opened the basement door and called down into the darkness. I called my best friend's name, thinking maybe she was there, but there was no answer. And I went back to sleep, feeling a little freaked out. I still can't believe that I had the guts to do that, but felt there was a logical explanation at the time. Later that week, I told everyone about it and they made fun of me. It was kind of an ongoing joke for a while. But fast forward a few months, when the others moved into the downstairs apartment. They all fell asleep at night hearing the exact same thing. We even went to the police department asking if they'd ever heard of anything like that. And they all looked freaked out too. We set up a booby trap, beer cans to the outside cellar door on the inside, in case someone was coming through the cellar door at night 
and they would knock all the cans over and nothing ever happened. Some poor soul probably still walks those stairs every night, until hopefully it moves on. I grew up in a small town where you wouldn't necessarily know everybody, but you're familiar with people in town. This story happened when I was maybe 15 to 16, so about 15 years ago. I was on my way to practice one Saturday morning when I noticed an older man on the corner ahead staring at me. Being me, I smile and wave at the guy as I pass. Back then I smiled at everyone, and then I stop at the same corner waiting to cross. The guy comes right up behind me and I vaguely remember smelling him, feel him breathe on my neck. I'm a bit worried but brush it off as being over reactionary. Light changes and I carry on, and this guy speeds up walking behind me, mumbling something to get my attention. I must have looked terrified, because a woman begins to walk next to me asking if I know the guy. I tell her that I don't, and she stays in pace with me, and has to go into the local grocery store that we're passing in front of with her. We get to the store, and the lady immediately grabs an employee at the register for help. At this point, I'm shaking in fear, trying to hide behind people standing by the register. They're all discussing something. I'm not sure what, because the guy that was following me was just staring at me through the window, making a throat slicing motion and I'm paralyzed. The people at the store gathered around me to make me feel safe, as I'm pretty sure I broke down in tears when he did that. And soon after, the cops came and I watched them arrest him. I don't remember much after that besides my parents picking me up from the store and going to the police station. My dad actually worked as a dispatcher in town at the time, and he told me a few days later the guy was off his meds and had been brought into a local psycho hospital for treatment. I never saw the man or the woman who saved me after that. So to my guardian angel, I never got the chance to thank you for protecting me. I'm a female, 27. At the time of this story, I was 19. I was living in Littleton, which is a suburb of Denver. I lived and worked within the same block, working at a hair salon, and lived in an apartment across the street and behind the salon. I lived with four other people in a studio apartment. Yes, it was chaos, but I was young and dumb and worked so much I was only there to sleep. While working at the salon, I met people of all walks of life. Most were nice and hardworking like me. In the plaza where the salon was, there happened to be an abundance of loiters, homeless, drunks mostly, and there was a particular man who I often saw. He was an older gentleman. He always smelt like booze, but was nice enough. Quite the flirt, which was uncomfortable for 19-year-old me. On several occasions, he asked me to come hang out and drink with him. I always refused because of my boyfriend, telling him that he wouldn't be pleased. And for the life of me, I'm pretty sure his name is Ma. One afternoon after getting off work at around four, I started to meander my way across the parking lot to the coffee shop. I ordered my drink and took it outside to sit and enjoy the sunny weather. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Mark approaching me rapidly a broad smile across his face asking me for a lighter. Begrudgingly, I obliged, passing it all over, and Mark lights his cigarette and returns the lighter to me. As he's not so graceful, he brushes past my arm, and a disgusted chill ran up my spine. I pulled away and stood up, saying it was time for me to go. Mark begged me to come and drink with him again, and I refused. After that, I didn't see him for several weeks. It was bliss, since I felt like he was always lurking around the plaza, waiting for some sorry soul to look his way. Then one night I decided to go for a walk around the neighborhood. I preferred night walks because it wasn't so hot, and I went around through downtown Littleton and looped back to my apartment complex. Then as I was about 10 minutes away from home, a figure appeared on the walkway ahead of me. At first, I thought nothing of it, since a lot of people were out and about. But as I got closer, I recognized the person. It was Mark. 
He swayed this way and that way on the cement, nearly falling into the road. This is where I made my mistake. I should have crossed the road or turned around, but instead I decided to walk past him, hoping he wouldn't know who I am. Alas, no dice. Mark got in my way and stopped, smiling that broad smile once again. I sighed, resigned my fate of having to talk to him, and asked him how he was and if he had a good day. He said he did, but that it would be better if he had some drinking company. I said not I, because I had to work early in the morning the next day. But unfortunately, he was unbothered and continued to beg, trying the drunk puppy dog eyes on me. I was slightly uneasy, but otherwise unmoved. Laughing awkwardly, I tried to edge my way around him. He held out his arm, blocking my path with a serious face, and I demanded that Mark move out of my way so that I could go home. For some reason, this flipped a switch within him. Suddenly angry, he grabbed me by the arm, holding me tightly. I winced and tried to shake him off, but Mark wouldn't relent. He took another step towards me, grabbed my other arm, and immediately I knew it was going to bruise. The pain sent me into fight or flight. My body picked both. First, I shoved Mark hard into the shrubbery behind him. Then I took off sprinting down the sidewalk. I didn't stop until I burst through the doors of my apartment, dissolved into tears and fell to the floor. I alarmed my roommates and they comforted and questioned me. After I pulled myself together, I told them what Mark did. My boyfriend was furious and stormed out the room with a bat in hand and his friends hot on his heels. My other roommates stayed with me. When my boyfriend and his friends returned, they said, luckily for Mark, that they couldn't find him. We thought of calling the cops, but rejected the idea because we weren't totally on the right side of the law, as pot wasn't legal in our state yet. So instead, I brought pepper spray and started carrying a weapon with me, and it did make me feel much safer. But I stopped going on walks after dark, unless I was in the company of my boyfriend. Strangely, I never saw Mark after that night, though I was completely okay with it. So wherever you are, Mark, just leave me alone next time, or I may be forced to poke a hole in you. This next story also happened while living in Littleton, Colorado. So that you might better understand me, this was when I was also 19. To give you a better image of what I looked like, I was 5 foot 7 and 130 pounds, and had wildly colored red hair, several facial piercings, and arm and chest tattoos. It was a warm day, so I was wearing weather-comfortable clothes, shorts and a tank top, along with a pair of flip-flops and a sun hat. Because of the previous situations I found myself in, I've stopped taking night walks. Instead, I went in the late afternoon. I had let my boyfriend take my truck to work because I didn't have to work that day and had no plans. But I wanted to surprise him at work and take him to dinner after he got off. So I started walking up Broadway towards Colfax. Now, if you've ever lived in Denver or have been there for any amount of time, people will generally warn you about Colfax Avenue. It's busy and some sketchy wildlife lives there and stalks the street. But for some reason, my oh so awesome roommates did not warn this little girl about the many horrors that could await you on Colfax Avenue. Okay, that may be a tad dramatic, but my experience was not pleasant in the least. I turned from Broadway onto Colfax. As soon as I turned, I was stepping into another world almost. There was a bus stop and it was bumping. I'm pretty sure I saw a guy taking bumps pressed against the nearest building. Several homeless people were laying and sitting in various places in the street. Two women were screaming at each other about something, and I walked quickly two or three blocks with my heart in my throat. I'm not cut out for this sort of social interaction. I accidentally made eye contact with a dirty man lurking in an alleyway. Quickly, I looked down at my flip-flops and walked on. After a few blocks, the crowd thinned out a bit, and I was feeling less frazzled. I was actually starting to enjoy my walk and the people watching what I was doing. But then I noticed this van. It was parked on a side street, trying to look inconspicuous because I could see the driver slide down his seat a little. 
I couldn't make out the details, but I could see it was an older male with a dark complexion and short dark hair, trying not to stare for too long. I committed this creeper van to memory. It was white with darkened windows, no company markings and no front's license plate. Red flags are going off in my head, but I push away the feeling and I walk around another block or two to see the van on a side street. It's moved up a few blocks as well. I get a nervous chill. Though I press on trying not to look scared, after another couple of blocks, I see this van again. I don't like where I think it's heading. So I stand my ground to face this van, staring into this man's face and waiting for a reaction for him to notice me. To my horror, he gets out the van, slamming the door behind him. He's a small Hispanic man, about five foot four, and shorter than me, but definitely bigger. My mind is racing as he runs down the road towards me. I'm frozen, I wasn't expecting this. As soon as he reaches me, he starts speaking in broken English that I can mostly understand. He compliments me, my hair, piercings, freckles, and butt. Oh joy, awkward. Awkwardly, I thank him, now confused. What does he want? Why is he so brave? Then he asks for intimacy. I nearly choke and ask him to repeat himself, not sure if I heard him correctly, but I was. He pulled out his wallet and offered me two $100 bills. I take a large step back as he grabs my butt and then licks his lips. I harshly tell him I'm not that kind of girl and he's barking up the wrong tree. I turn and speed walk away from this guy, starting to panic and I'm trying to think of a plan. The man is following me, waving the 200s around like it would convince me to go back. The first door I see I run to and yank open. I throw myself in at max speed and bounce to the bouncer. I fall on my butt with a yelp and the bouncer helps me up and asks why I'm in such a hurry. I'm too flustered to talk as he's asking for ID. I look around and realize that I'm in a pub. I tell him on the verge of tears I'm only 19 and trying to hide from a guy outside. I'm practically having a panic attack as the bouncer guides me to the bar and fetches me a glass of water. The bouncer wants a description of the man and I give it. He tells me to hang tight and disappear around the door. A few minutes later, he tells me the wham won't be a problem anymore. Reasonably, I'm still scared. My new hero asks me where I'm heading and I check on my GPS on my phone, only two blocks to my boyfriend's work. The bouncer clocks out on his break and offers to walk me the remaining two blocks. I beam and latch onto the guy's arm, thanking him repeatedly. He pats my hand, laughing, telling me to keep off Colfax from this point on and I promised I would. When we walked into my boyfriend's work, he gave me a quizzical look. I thanked the bouncer again and sent him on his way. I explained what happened to the man and he laughed at me. Perhaps I deserved that, but no one warned me. I didn't take him to dinner that night and never walked that street alone again. So creeper in the creepy van, stay away from me and keep your $200 for something less creepy. I'm a 22 year old uni student living with just my mate. I've lived with a lot of people before and hated it. So two lads could have been seen as the bachelor life. I loved staying up late, either gaming or just chatting to my mates on Skype. My friend, however, is very predictable and goes to bed at 11, showers at 10.30 like clockwork. So I stayed up until 2 AM and I have the top floor. It has three windows, one huge window that is slanted off the roof that I always keep the blinds open. When I say it's huge, I often climb through it to chill on my roof and watch the stars. There's a lot of space for me. Between 2 to 3 AM I climb in bed, boxes only, and watch YouTube videos until I drift off facing away from the window. During watching Cryatic, who is an amazingly chill voice when reading horror stories, I hear creaking. Assuming it was the video getting to me in the psychological horror high, I ignored it. The video ended and I was about to choose another longer one when the creaking came back. The walls are paper thin and I've had a house invasion before, so I was a little on edge. Calming myself by switching sides, just in case anyone comes in my door, 
It was also the same side as my window. The creaking continued, until it felt like whatever it was was in my room. My eyes couldn't believe what I saw. A dark figure slowly manifested at my window, first a head, then a body consuming my window. I waited and tried to make it out, just staring and thinking. That's when I heard it, a tapping on the window glass. It was real. I jumped out of bed, remembering that I kept a weapon somewhere in my room. Where was it? I slammed on the lights and saw a face looking back at me. Show to help, I screamed. No movement. We stood there looking at each other. Show to get up here, I yelled again. I stood at my door, practically naked, wondering if I should stay or run. I stayed and my roommate never came. The man at the window said, Excuse me, let me explain myself. I stood there speechless. Can you please open the window so I can speak to you? He pleaded. I beckoned near the window. What are you doing on my roof? I'm your neighbor, he apologizes. I take a second thought but open my window. Sorry, I'm drunk and trying to find my window. How are you? You scared the living hell out of me. So do you know Lucian? I was friends with my neighbor and he just left for a different university and formed me other people were moving in. I motioned to get dressed as I realized I was naked. Uh, no, he replied as I got dressed. Lucian from next door, he said there would be new people moving in. Ah, yes, I know him, he replies. After talking to him and feeling calm, he says he must try to find his window and leaves. I watch as the black greasy hair and slightly trimmed beard with an athletic figure goes to the left. I go downstairs to my housemate and yell at him for not coming up. He says he didn't hear me run down, so there was no need to panic. Having a laugh about it, I go to my neighbor's house in the morning to joke, knocking on the door, and it's answered by a big, slightly fat man, who I am now friends with, and I ask to see both of them and introduce myself as the neighbor. One more person comes down with mousy brown hair, no beard, and is still quite small. After meeting them, I later had a small gathering with friends, and when 2am came, I told them it was time to get my own back. Climbing out of the window alone, I shuffled to the next window and mischievously knocked on it. I looked inside to see his horrified face, but there was nothing. The room was empty. No one lived there. The landlord told me of the previous tenants being squatters and were annoyed about being moved out for the refurbishment. It was not my neighbor. It was not a nearby window. I opened mine. Rooftop stranger. Let's never meet again. I was born in the 60s and didn't think I'd live to see 30 because I did drugs, drank and loved to drive fast and ride with friends that drove faster. I was a loner. Even very young, I'd walk all around our town alone. My grandma's house was two blocks from the fairgrounds, and as a small girl, I'd watch the show parade of fairgoers that you never seem to see around the town the rest of the year. I was 14, the bicentennial. When the fair came to town, in 1976. I waited for grandma to go to sleep and walked to the darkened carnival. Most of the carnies I met were in their twenties and looked out for me. We smoked together, listened to their biographies and they're all fascinating people. When we were at high school, there was a popular couple. She a doe-eyed all-American beauty. He a senior, a man, yet had some boy left on his face. Even better, they were two of the sweetest people I'd ever met. It was Friday, and talk among the girls all day was that he was going to give her his class ring on their date, which was a huge deal back then. It was a cold winter night when they pulled off the road and parked. He left his truck running to keep the heater on. Neither of them returned home from the date. Family and friends searched through the night. They were found in the morning, perished in each other's arms. You see where he parked, snow packed into the tailpipe, and they asphyxiated from the fumes. Victims of the poison turned cherry red. 
I still can't get the picture out of my head of what they must have looked like. Rosy cheeks. Was there frost on them? I grew up where basketball was king. The three high schools in my town were rivals on the state level many seasons. When I was there, the varsity basketball players dated the cheerleaders. One Saturday they were hanging out and the guys were shooting hoops. One of the team stars twisted his ankle and had to go to the ER. The boys got in one car and the girls followed in the other. The driver in the front of the car couldn't resist showing off for the girls and had a spectacular crash right in front of their girlfriends. Three guys walked away, but the fourth lost his life. His girlfriend lost it all at the sight of the body and literally hasn't gotten over it 40 years later. Finally, my boyfriend and I decided we wanted to have sandwiches from the local pizza joint. We picked up our order and drove up to a park that also served as lover's lane. My boyfriend killed the headlights and rolled to a stop under a large tree. It was winter and full on dark. As we ate, our eyes became adjusted to the dark or lack of, and we could make out a sedan parked a couple of cars lengths away from us. We noticed a guy slumped over on the steering wheel. We didn't think anything about it. We figured he was drunk and parked there to sleep it off. The next day over breakfast, mom mentioned they found a body in the park. My food stuck in my throat, reading the newspaper. She said the driver hadn't felt well earlier in the day and probably had a massive heart attack as soon as he parked. I was 17 and just got home from some event, either with a church group or some friends. It was about 11 p.m. and as mandated, I woke up my parents to let them know that I got home safe and sound. I don't remember why I felt the need to shower that night, but I did. The shower was a stall with a glass door and a really high pressure stream, which was almost deafening in that plastic stall. You would have to shout at me right next to the bathroom door in order for me to hear you. So that's why what happened next was so shocking. Mid shower, there was this loud blood curdling female scream that I could hear from the shower. I had never heard someone scream like that in real life, and it paralyzed me for a second. I have two sisters, so I immediately thought the worst. I burst out of the shower, run to my parents from dripping wet, wearing only a towel, fully expecting my parents to be getting up to see who was screaming, as the house wasn't big, it was just a double wide trailer with an addition. I was shocked to find them in bed, still asleep. Their door was open. If I had heard the scream, then they really should have heard it too, especially since neither of them are heavy sleepers. I woke them up quickly and asked if they had heard that scream, which they didn't. Mum was concerned, and Dad hopped out of bed and was checking on my siblings, all sound asleep. We searched the house, and even looked outside, but there was nothing. He usually gets annoyed and upset when I talk about the paranormal. He had to exercise some evil spirits from a room when he was on his mission in his 20s. So he prefers just to have them not exist at our house. No scary movies or anything of the sort. But this time he was pretty calm, probably because he could tell just how upset I was. I wasn't dreaming, hallucinating or making it up. And he knew it. I was standing naked with a towel, nearly hyperventilating and still dripping from the shower. Dad tried to comfort me telling me it was probably just a cat outside. Yeah, really. He didn't believe it, but that's what he was selling, so I better buy it. I really had nothing else to do but to go down to bed, down in the basement where most of the activity occurred, but you bet your butt I didn't sleep there much. Whatever it was, was screaming, would bug me periodically. I was the only one in the basement, so naturally I was the only witness. I have plenty of stories that have also happened, but none which my family would believe. Everyone has that one set of neighbors that you love to hate. They're always partying late into the crack of dawn, throwing their trash on your side of the yard, asking to borrow things or other such acts. Not to gatekeep having bad neighbors, but I feel like the years of hell these neighbors have caused my family 
were way worse than most normal awful neighbors. I'll let you decide. It's hard to condense so much into a few short paragraphs, and even still, I feel like this story will be sort of long. Setting-wise, a house across from Mars was up for rent, and this would become the gateway to hell that ensues. We knew the person who owned the house, so some of this would be stuff she told us afterwards. The first signs of trouble started when they moved in, driving their moving truck onto the driveway and parking a nice Lexus on the lawn. For the kind of people that would come to live there, a Lexus was definitely suspect, but parking cars on the lawn became a daily habit that killed it over time. Another red flag was the number of people that came and went as the weeks went by. No one knew the true amount of people that actually lived there, but the regulars were as follows. An overweight blonde, think Walmart shopper but uglier, a somewhat more decent brunette with glasses. She was a less frequent visitor, but we did see her often. A hideous rat-looking punk boy that couldn't have been older than 18. A teenage twig girl who looked like she was doing some devious stuff in her spare time and appeared anemic. And two small toddlers, a boy and a girl. This new addition to the neighborhood quickly claimed their spot as the loudest people in the neighborhood with seemingly endless parties and arguments that would last for hours at a time. They had the foulest mouths you could ever imagine, and even the youngest child could be heard saying words that no young person should ever be exposed to. Though the days were nice, we couldn't open our windows unless we wished to hear the vulgar music that was blasting through the open garage door as one of the teens worked on a dented shell of a car every evening. A real selling point was the small toddlers would be left outside in the front yard to fend for themselves for hours on end. These people were clearly living on welfare and other such government programs, and the most annoying thing they did? Come the first full month they were there, ask us for things. The brunette lady was, more often than not, the one who showed up at our door, often with a child on her hip or one in tow behind her. The requests weren't anything weird at first, sugar, eggs, and my mum was too nice to refuse. Then they became more strange. They asked for diapers, an electric girdle to make grilled cheese, which they did surprisingly return. And once they asked if they could charge their phone for a bit, I guess they were a bit behind on their bills and their electricity got shut off. Some things like that would happen a lot more frequently in the future. The highlight of this story has yet to come. All of this pales in comparison to what happened next. It was a hot summer's day, one that makes you feel like you're moving in slow motion and can't think properly. I just happened to look outside and to my horror, I witnessed the young teen girl dragging a screaming toddler into the house after he'd been running around outside by himself and shut the mesh door behind her. I could still make out the figure of the girl who began to call the child all sorts of obscenities. I quickly called my mother, who stormed outside telling her to stop what she'd call the police. The girl called her a nosy so-and-so and shut the front door. Just as my mum finished calling Child Protective Services, the blonde lady, her gangly teen son and the violent teenage girl were pounding at our door, thirsty for blood. My mother slowly dropped the blinds and eased the windows open a crack, stating that she would not open the door. The nasty woman then proceeds to yell at my mother for not staying out of other people's business and that she should just leave them alone. This went on for almost a half hour before my mum had enough. My mother calmly explained that so long as she had to witness such cruel acts and foul mouths, she wasn't going to stay out of their business, and if they didn't get off her property, she would call the police. She shut the window, closed the blinds, and they kept on their cussing. Not long after the police were called for similar reasons by our other neighbors, and the family were given a final warning and an eviction date. They stayed weeks after the water and power had been cut. When they realized they had to move out or be arrested, they did everything in their power to destroy and deface the house they were staying in. The landlady was in tears, and she gave my mother a tour of the now vacant house. Windows had been smashed, sinks were ripped out and tossed into the yard, 
Walls were riddled with holes and foul graffiti. Toilets were blocked with human waste, and whatever they couldn't take was destroyed. It's been some time, and that same house has now been filled with a new family, but the memory is still fresh. Horrible neighbours? I hope to never meet you again. When I was in grade 11, and I had just moved to a new town, I quickly became attracted to this one girl, and I would have given up my left nut for a date. We got paired up to be partners in our food and fabrics class, and I totally pulled out all the stops. I was doing whatever it took to get a date with this girl. In the class, there were a couple of projects where you'd have to sew a pillowcase or a pair of pajamas. My family didn't have a sewing machine, so we would do the project at her house. Upon the visits, I began to question how badly I wanted this girl. She lived in what appeared to be a wood cabin, and her father seemed legitimately insane. The walls were lined with animal skulls. The guy was a hardcore hunter. He had bare skin rugs and antlers all over the place. He would always walk around with his shirt off, drinking a Budweiser, chewing tobacco, and carrying a firearm, and never spoke a word to me. By this time, I was starting to gain some friendship in the school, and one of the guys I met, Neil, noticed I had taken a liking to her. He then asked me if I had heard about her parents. He proceeded to tell me that her dad ended the life of her mother and got away with it. Her body was found in the middle of the town, pumped with a couple of rounds from a shotgun. He got off on the charges from lack of proof, and she had to live with him because he was her last living relative. At this point, I was like, what? The story made no sense and I wasn't about to believe it, but it definitely rattled me. But there was no way I was gonna bring it up with her. A little time passes and I ask her out. I go to her place to grab her and she's gorgeous. Her dad makes a comment about, you know what'll happen to you if you touch her. And suddenly the story is the only thing I can think about. We went skating, then to a movie, but I was terrified the whole time. I just couldn't get the thought out of my head that her dad was going to end my life when I got back to her place. So after a subpar date, I started the long drive back to her house. We get to the end of her driveway, which is long as she had an acreage, and she gets to the park and turns off the lights. She wants a kiss. At this point, forget her dad, I lean over and kiss her. We stop, I turn the lights back on, and there's blood in the snow and at the end of the driveway. I wanted to say something, but I didn't want to sound like a coward. Her dad was a hunter, right? I'm sure there's a logical explanation. I put the car in drive and start winding down the driveway. The trail of blood seems to be getting thicker, and I'm more freaked out. She still says nothing as she's fixing her hair in the mirror. I keep driving, more blood. I turn the last corner of her driveway and see my headlights shift from the trees to her father, standing in the middle of the driveway, covered in blood, blood all around him, huge weapon in hand, and what appeared to be a naked human body lying at his feet. I'm hyperventilating. Suddenly I'm crying and I don't know why and I piss my pants. Her dad takes me to the hospital. Turns out I have had mild asthma for my entire life and had a panic attack. The dad found a bear at the end of the driveway, shot it, dragged it down the driveway and skinned it, or at least the part that I saw before we got back. That was a little over three years ago and I'm still with the girl. Her dad calls me a coward all the time, except we've gone on hunting trips together and I'm pretty sure he's a fan. Neil was a jealous ex. Her parents split up, and her mum is actually pretty awesome too. When I was an infant, my parents decided it was time to buy a house. They bought one in one of those developments that was yet to be built. When the house was completed, we moved in. Of course, I was too young to remember any of this. When I got to age five or six, I realized I was terrified of our basement. I was not afraid of the dark or any other basement, just ours. Very specifically, a spot beside the furnace, where my mother had a pantry shelf of canned goods. 
I always felt something reaching for me there. It was angry and wanted to grab me. The feeling never went away. My dad built a rec room down there, but I still sprinted past the furnace spot to get to it. If I was asked to get a can from the pantry shelf, I'd grab it and run upstairs at top speed. I was told off all the time for running on the stairs, but that was nothing compared to the feeling the spot gave me. We moved, and the dreaded basement faded into memory. When I was an older teen, some neighbours my parents were friends with in our old home came to visit. After saying hi, I went up to my room and the adults chatted while having some drinks. I started to go downstairs again and heard the husband of the neighbour say that it was such a shame what happened when they were building your house, and my dad agreeing. I froze and started eavesdropping on them. When our house was being built, a young boy was fooling around on the back of some excavator-type machinery. He fell and was crushed by it. They were digging the foundations of our home, that basement, and I'd put the money on the exact spot he perished on, although there's no way to know it or prove it. I was alive, he wasn't. He wasn't happy about that. I was a daredevil kind of kid who routinely did stupid stuff that could have easily injured me, or worse. Did that make him hate me? Did he think he could take my living body for himself? I don't know. All I know is something angry reached for me down there. Anyway, I entered the room, and they shut up. I quietly said, and you laughed at me in my imagination. I knew something was there. I knew it. Why do you deny it? You could have cut the air with a knife. Then my dad said, we didn't want to scare you. No one else in my family felt anything down there. It kind of felt good to find out what the problem was. This was the start of knowing. I felt things others didn't. Before I begin, I should state this was a few years ago. I'm a tiny woman. I, at the time, looked like a teenager, and I've always been mindful that I am an easier target. I had seen a job interview for a small business looking for a secretary. No experience needed, as they would provide on-the-job training, and that was kind of a thing I was looking for. I applied. I heard back quickly and was invited to an interview. When I arrived, I was excited. It was a bit of a journey from my home, but it was in a beautiful old building on the third floor with a modern layout inside, though you could tell it was very new, as it was bare bones and very little had been unpacked. Still though, if you have to work somewhere, might as well be a nice building, right? The interview seemed lovely. I only encountered female members of staff and they were all warm and lovely. The woman interviewing me was amazing and even sat talking to me for a while after just getting to know me. When I got home, I wasn't in the door long before I got a phone call from them. I nailed the interview. Awesome. I thought I was offered the job, I was about to accept when I was told on the phone, okay, you'll come here tomorrow and we'll have a van drive you to where you're gonna be working. I was confused. What did they mean? They then told me I'd be meeting with customers on their behalf and talking and selling stuff. I was not comfortable with this as this wasn't what I was interviewed for, but I gave them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they had a second position they thought I would fit in better with. I thought it wouldn't be that weird, as a new company and while not that I was comfortable with it, I should at least hear them out. So I ask more questions and the woman on the other end of the line is getting more snippy and tense. The friendliness now gone, and she wouldn't reveal who I would be going with or where. By this point, so many red flags had popped up, I said no thanks and respectfully declined the offer. For anyone curious about what happened after, I reported this as it seemed very dodgy, but when they were checked in on the floor, it was no longer occupied. They'd apparently just rented it for a week and were gone. I was 18 and decided to drop out of high school to go with my girlfriend to Central America. I had been having a fantastic time. 
except for one incident that was a bit uncomfortable with an older gentleman. I would say in general people were nicer and kinder to us than I could have ever have expected. Anyway, it was kind of the end of a long ride from a beach to Leon, and in order to be able to make it back to Granada, which is where we were going to stay that night, we were shuffled onto a bus where we really didn't know where we were going. Over the course of the bus ride people began to filter off the bus. We didn't notice at first because it was over the course of a few stops and we were trying to rest a bit. But by the time we got into the city of Managua, there were just about four or five people on the bus including us. The sun had gone down, the bus was driving into areas where literally every structure was half built concrete and corrugated metal sheets and the streets were getting narrower and narrower. We saw three dead dogs on the side of the road, which were being eaten by other dogs, and then we stopped looking out the windows. Eventually the bus stops, the driver quickly ushers us off the bus, and then locks the doors and drive away. We look around and it's the scene of a nightmare. I don't want to over dramatize it, because in many ways it was the saddest and darkest part I've ever been to, but there's a lot of desperation there that I couldn't fully comprehend. It was like if you took everything terrifying a drug addict might meet in East Harlem at 5am on a Tuesday, every schizophrenic patient who's ever received treatment of any kind, and every young opportunistic criminal you've ever met, and left them to fend for a year. One woman who sticks out in my mind was standing on a pile of cinder blocks, licking a downed power line with her eyes rolled back in her head. We stood there for a good three minutes trying to say under our breaths to each other, what are we going to do? Every cab that drove by ignored traffic lights and wouldn't stop for us and people started noticing. The true scariest moment was when people started coming out of their houses and just standing there staring directly at us. My girlfriend was on the verge of tears at this point and finally this little old woman came running out of her house yelling at us, what are you doing here? in Spanish and grabs us and pulls us into her friend's shop shouting and shooing away the people who have crowded closest to us. She then tells us that if we have walked a block in any direction, we would have been robbed, beaten or worse. She locked us into her shop until we could jump into a car that her friend had called that pulled up in front of the shop. Moral of the story, we nearly perished in Nicaragua. In March of 2018, I had a terrible breakup, and it really destroyed me as a person. I was in a deep depression and very angry. I had terrible violent thoughts and wanted revenge, but never acted on it and attempted to do anything to myself. Shortly after I got a DUI from drinking with a friend, I lost my job and all I wanted to do was pass. I didn't want to love anymore. And this is when things started to change. First, my door would open by itself and I would always think maybe it was a draft since I'm in the basement, so I didn't think much of it. Then when I closed my door, I would wake up to it being open and told myself that I could have forgotten. One night when I was trying to sleep, something was tugging my bed sheets and I thought maybe it was just my toes. I was wrong. After I pulled my sheets back, it rigged my sheets a good 10-12 inches away from me and I was crapping a brick and just acted like nothing happened and pulled my sheets back again. When I woke up, I wasn't with sheets. I didn't sleep in my room for two months after that and nothing happened. In January, I started sleeping in my room again and the same old stuff with the door kept happening. Eventually, it started messing with my legs, picking them up and dropping them and I just kept on telling myself I was having muscle spasms or something akin to that. Everything always happened at night. That's why I got nervous. This morning at 10 a.m. I got up and I was shoved back into bed and a dark figure stood there for a second and left my room. This is the first time it's done anything violent. I don't know what to do because it wasn't just a push, but it was as if it were angry and touching me until I got up to look. I'm sharing my experience because I really don't know what to do. Has anyone else experienced anything like this before?
Just to preface, I work nights. So I spend most of the time home alone while my brother is at work. Before I go to sleep in the morning, I'll lie in bed and browse Reddit for a while. Yesterday I'm in bed just about to call it a night when I hear something hit the counter in my kitchen. My aunt likes to walk in sometimes, but I check the cameras and my car is the only one there. I immediately dismiss it and resume my browsing. Five minutes later, I hear solid footsteps coming down the hall. I drop everything and just listen. It's the unmistakable sound of boots slowly walking up and eventually back down the hall. I messaged my brother to tell him since minor stuff happens sometimes. My dog stares at the wall and closet all the time and he doesn't bark but just stares and we joke for a bit. I also think it's worth noting that I worked a half day last night. So I got home around 1am and I had to be quiet since my brother was sleeping in the room next to me. Finally, I got settled into bed and got a movie on Netflix. A while into it, I started hearing the same footsteps I hear the other day, except this one's a lot louder. Of course, I paused the movie and put all my focus onto this. I stood by the cracked floor for 10 to 20 minutes, trying to get a recording of it, but didn't get anything too special. After a while, I hear them even louder and even closer. They were coming from the attic. There was obviously something or someone in there. It wasn't long after that my brother's alarm started going off and he got out of bed. I immediately went to tell him and he flipped out immediately. I was going to tell him not to go up there, but he did anyway. When he looked up, there was nothing and nowhere to hide. I honestly don't know what's going on, but the creepy noises are starting to get to me. Our house is over a hundred years old, built sometime around the 1850s. There was a demon in the house when we moved in the 1990s, but we had it removed. Occasionally there have been unexplained occurrences, but I don't believe they were angelic or demonic in origin, just odd things going on. Anyway, onto the story. I was sitting in our living room on the first floor one night while I was still in high school. I was up late working on a paper due the next day, and it's about 11.30 p.m. My cat Caesar had been on and off to encourage and distract me. As I'm typing away on my laptop, Caesar suddenly goes out into the small walkway between our dining room, kitchen and bathroom, where the cellar door is cracked open so the cats can go into the basement. I hear him tear off through the house at lightning pace, but think nothing of it because cats are weird. Then I see him trot by and go back to the same spot and repeat his actions. I'm trying to ignore this because cats are weird, especially this one. But then our second cat, Mocha, goes in to do the same thing. Peers in the door, runs away with her tail puffed out. And at this point I'm freaking out and I'm convinced that someone had somehow gotten into the basement. I scurry up to my room and get an ax that I'd bought in an auction. I creep down the stairs with a flashlight and go to the basement door. Both Caesar and our third cat, Freeway, are there. Caesar looks in and both take off running again. I'm starting to regret my choice, but have to face the threat for the safety of my sleeping parents upstairs. I fling the door open, hit the lights and ready the axe. Only to see nothing. No intruder, no demons, hell, not even a mouse. I cautiously go down the stairs and clear the basement. There are not many places to hide since my mum is a hoarder. I come back up the stairs to find my three cats hiding there like the last half hour didn't happen. I shrugged it off and went back to do my homework, but kept my axe close at hand. I've always been enamored with the unknown and mysteries and those sort of things. My favorite book as a kid, which I still have, is Marvels and Mysteries of the Unexplained, which is a compilation of unexplained phenomena, UFOs, hauntings, crimes, all wrapped up into a large book. It wasn't until I went on a family holiday to the UK that it was confirmed for me. We went on the usual touristy joints or Buckingham Palace, the Tower of London, but the one thing I loved the most were the castles. We must have gone to at least 20. 
They each had their own ghost stories, and some I had heard before. I never saw, heard, or felt anything, at almost all of them. But it was this little out-of-the-way tower called Hermitage Castle that really made me wholeheartedly believe in the paranormal. We rocked up at 7am, drizzly morning and there wasn't anybody there yet. Even the tour guide slash caretaker hadn't arrived yet. So we went for a bit of a stroll around the adjacent cemetery, which had a giant grave in it, supposedly. One of the tourist guide ladies rocked up, and we had a bit of a chat about the place, and she said to us, There's one room in the castle that people have a crazy feeling like. I was like, yeah, yeah, same story in every castle we've been to. We were walking through the castle and didn't feel or sense anything. That's when I see my dad and brother step out of a sort of basement room, that had a well in it. Sort of like, get me the hell out of here. So I took one step into that room and a complete incredible sense of utter dread washed over me. I never saw or heard anything. It was just an insane feeling that something horrible had happened there and I wanted to get out as quickly as I could. Since then I've had a few other experiences but that was certainly the one that made me believe in energies that are beyond our comprehension. This happened 24 years ago, and isn't story I share often. My friend Mike and I are at a bar one night with a friend of ours. We're there with our friend Art, an older guy, and we've known him for a few years from hanging out in clubs. We're in our early 20s, and Art is in his mid-30s or so. But hey, we're all having fun and trying to pick up chicks, so age isn't an issue with us. The night comes to a close, and Art asks us if we want to go to a party with him in Westchester. It's about a 30 to 40 minute drive from where we are but in the opposite direction of home. There's no guarantee of how big or fun this party would be. So we politely declined and headed to the after hours spot near our house. Fast forward a few days, we read about a girl going missing out in West Chester. We joke and say, thank God we weren't out there and let the news pass. Fast forward another two years an arrest is made concerning the missing girl. The girl, Amy Willard. Her life was taken from her and her body was discovered a few days after she went missing. This story made every headline in the area and I believe got some national attention. In fact, the show Forensic Files did an episode about it. The murderer, Arthur Bomar the same art that Mike and I were hanging with the night her life was ended. Had we gone with him to Westchester, it is possible that we either would be in jail with him or worse. I wouldn't be here sharing this experience if that were the case. See, art ended the life of a man in Nevada and served 11 years for it. When paroled in 1990, he moved out to PA and he was arrested for breaking and entering in 1998. And when apprehended, he was driving the car of a woman named Maria Gabuenos, whose remains were found in March of 1988. And her life and how it ended remains an unsolved mystery and still is to this day. They linked his DNA to the Willard case and conviction. He still sits on death row to this day, I believe. I once saw a guy light himself and then jump off an eight story building. The aftermath is something that I would much rather forget. As you can imagine, it's quite horrifying. When I saw something pinkish roll towards me, I assumed it was a stray basketball. But as you can imagine, it was something else entirely. Like I said before, this is an event I would rather forget. And it was one of the most disturbing things in my life. To this day, I now stay away from fire and am supremely afraid of heights.
This happened in London, about nine years ago. The day started normally enough. I went to the British Museum with two of my good friends, and after a few hours of looking at the Egyptian mummies, followed by a coffee and cake, we wandered back to the tube station to make our separate ways home. A suave looking guy stopped us on the street and asked us if we wanted to earn £25 and get some free clothes. The obvious answer seemed to be yes. He ushered us into a pop-up shop that had been decked out like a trashy boudoir and handed us each brightly coloured cupcakes and clipboards containing disclaimers to sign. I barely skimmed the small print, but the gist seemed to be that they were asking us to give a company I'd never heard of permission to film us and use our footage for marketing purposes. My more sensible friend backed out of this point. I'm not feeling this, see you guys soon. We waved her goodbye and giddily followed our host over to a clothes rail where he invited us to pick out an outfit to try on. And the best bit is that you get to keep everything afterwards. My magpie eyes immediately alighted on the gold sequin dress with the £140 price tag, which I naturally thought I would sell on eBay later, while my friend chose a more practical skirt and top. Our selections in hand, we headed down to the basement where the fitting rooms were. Just to let you know, there are cameras in there, girls, but don't be shy. The fitting rooms were fairly standard cubicles, except for being rigged up with cameras and mics, and the mirrors on the back walls doubling up as a second door. Once I rather self-consciously pulled on the dress, a voice through the speakers asked me if I would be willing to show the dress off. I mumbled something back like, uh, okay although the dress I picked didn't fit me too well, but why not? With that, an exaggeratedly dejected sound effect played, and they asked me to change back into my own clothes and return through the front door. My friend, it transpired, had experienced the opposite outcome. She'd been similarly if not more reluctant to strut her stuff when asked, but they'd encouraged her to go for it, and told her to push on the mirror to open the door. It swung open to reveal a catwalk with cameras flashing and a crowd of onlookers sitting and cheering and clapping and whooping as she walked out, dying inside. I could hear the commotion from where I was hanging around waiting to collect my cash and finally started to wonder what the hell was going on and why we were there. A minute or two later, my somewhat startled friend rejoins me and the camera crew comes over to interview us about how we felt as we were getting changed, filmed, and in our faces the whole time. I shrug. Normal, I guess. But what about the smell? I paused, alarmed. Oh, I'm afraid I don't have a sense of smell. I've got anosmia, I confess. Was there something wrong? At this point, the crew breaks down in hysterics, asking me if I'm for real. The usual, you mean you can't smell anything? Reaction. Then comes to the big reveal. It was an experiment. Your changing room smelled of stale cheese and feet, and that sapped away your self-confidence, while your friend's changing room smelled of fabric conditioner, and it made her feel so fabulous she couldn't wait to get on the catwalk. We're making a TV show ad to show how the great smell of our fabric conditioner is empowering and confidence boosting. I glanced skeptically at my friend who shrugged. Empowered isn't quite the word she used to describe her catwalk experience to me afterwards, but there you go. At least my not being able to smell meant they probably weren't gonna be able to use the footage for their questionable commercial, or at least I hope they never did. The brand of fabric conditioner isn't even available in the UK, so it wouldn't have been shown on TV anyway. We collect our money and run, coasting on an adrenaline rush from the unexpected randomness of the experience, our free clothes and the fact we made it out of there alive. Later on that evening, my high degenerates. I have a few house parties to go to, so I of course decided it would be fitting to wear the gold dress, which in the cold light of day is truly hideous and totally not me. No good can ever come of a night 
where you go out in a gold dress. And I'll spare you the details of all that transpired, which ultimately concluded in me making a hasty getaway through the first floor window of the apartment to a semi-famous record producer. But at some point in between the party's alcohol-induced generosity inspired me to give away the envelope of my hard-earned £25 to some poor soul I encountered on the street who'd been slapped with a parking ticket. And for the dress, I never wore it again, nor did I ever bother to sell it. It's still to this day on an abandoned clothes rail in my parents' attic, laden with memories of a crazy day. When I first moved into our dad's house, I was around 15 or 16. First night I experienced my first ever sleep paralysis experience, where I heard my twin and our dad talking. He told her, don't you tell Amy this, but the house is extremely haunted. And as I was hearing this, I saw the shadow of a massive man standing over me. After that, I started sleeping with a blanket over my eyes. The next experience, I was drawing in the basement and listening to scary stories when I zoned out into a daydream of my twin walking down the stairs with a blank look on her face. She walks to the bathroom, ignoring my hello, closes the door and straight up starts banging on the door. I zone back into my art and that was the end of that. About a year later, I was drawing and watching some deep well unboxing videos when the bathroom door rips open. Something to know about that door is that I can hardly get it open without throwing my entire body weight into it. Final experience. Towards the end of my dream, I'm open my eyes all the way. It was pitch black. I hear my fiance saying in a very garbled manner, why is the door shut? I ask, what? She says it again after the third time of repeating it. And I'm slowly able to see and somewhere in that, I woke up looking around my room.